Hello and welcome to the fourth stop of the Free Ride World Tour. My name's Ed Lee. This is Martin Winkler. Are you excited, Marty? Oh, yes, I am. Back again in Haines, Alaska. Dream coming true for every one of us, so I uh, couldn't be happier. All of the pre-event checks have been done. The face is in perfect condition here in Haines, Alaska, the last frontier, as it's known. And if we take a quick look at the map here, we can show you exactly where we are. It's called the last frontier for good reason. You can see here, Alaska is tucked up into the northwest corner of North America. And if you track down from Anchorage, Alaska, the biggest city, through the fjords and inlets in southeast Alaska, you'll find Haines nestled under the Canadian border, surrounded by some towering mountain ranges. And they look absolutely splendid today, Marty. Oh, yes. We got some fresh snow over the last few days. Luckily, not too much, as this can happen quite easily here. Uh, and so the, the slopes are pretty stable and safe. And uh, I think we're going to have epic conditions, especially for a contest. Well, it's the second time that we've been here. But if you're new to Haynes, if you haven't come across this uh, epicenter of free riding before, we can show you a little welcome clip. It's a 30-minute flight or a four-hour ferry north of Alaska's capital, Juneau. And you'll find the small city of Haines, originally settled by the Klingit people more than 2,000 years ago. It was called Deshu, or End of the Trail. Haines has witnessed the boom and bust synonymous with pioneer communities. The fur trade, the gold rush, military bases and oil pipelines have all come and gone. Today, tourists made the pilgrimage north to Haines, not just for the stunning scenery and wildlife, but also for the Aurora Borealis displays and, in the case of free riders, to challenge themselves in the stunning mountains that isolate this remote town. Now, we've got a packed schedule for you today. The weather is set to close in a little bit later. We've got helis buzzing competitors in and out of the ridge here, up to two start zones up at the top. But it's been a long journey to get here, Marty. Oh, yeah. We have already had three events, so the riders had to prove themselves. They had to make the cut, which is a difficult one with the stack of riders that we had from the start of the, the season. And so we here are in the pinnacle of this tour with uh, the fourth stop and, of course, leading into the finals in Verbier soon to come. OK, well, let's take a quick look back over the season so far. Free Ride World Tour is made up of five stops, with each one offering different terrain and conditions to test the competitors. This year, Valnor Arcalis in Andorra was the first stop, and low snow levels challenged the athlete's ability to read snow conditions and deliver technical lines on a face littered with rocks. The second stop in the world's capital of steep skiing, Chamonix, was blessed with perfect conditions, which allowed the world's best to launch some of the biggest drops we've seen so far this winter. At the third stop in Fieberbrunn, it was crunch time with nearly half the field being cut for the next event. The Vildsi loader face demanded creativity from the skiers and snowboarders who wanted to travel to Haines for the fourth stop. After this event, we'll move back to Europe for the final stop at the spiritual home of the Freeride World Tour, Berbier. Now, Martin, we talked very quickly there about the personality and character that each of the venues have. W how would you describe the face here in Haines? The face here in Haines uh, definitely comes, let's say, down to size. Size of the venue itself is above like 680 meters of vertical drop, which is massive. And we have like super steep areas, rolling areas. You have so a ton of features. All the, the, the faces that we choose on the Freeride World Tour have a variety of features, but this is the maximum you can get. Like from all the aspects of free riding, you can choose on a silver plate of, yeah, of yeah. goodies. An enormous all-you-can-eat buffet of terrain. <laughs> exactly. Here, here, actually, it's a very interesting image. We have the comparison of the two venues that are to come, like now, on the right-hand side, Look us right, we have Haines, Alaska, here the venue, as it's called. 
and to your left, it's half of the Bec de Ross. And you can see there instantly the contrast. We've got huge mountains here, but covered in snow in Alaska, and then you've got this jagged, rocky face. They, they're going to draw completely different skill sets from the riders. Yeah, and actually, it's not just a perspective thing. These are pretty similar in size of uh, just above uh, 600 meters of vertical, but you're very right that we have the Bec de Ross, which is known for the, its rocky and so exposed terrain it's so going to it's going to be difference. slightly slower it's going to be uh, you're going to need to have your route finding skills absolutely on point whereas here it's really there's almost a safety net the volume of snow we have and all of those features are going to allow people to get way more creative yeah like the fun factor is definitely up here in Haines compared to the Bec de Ross where the best riders in the world are actually fear have fear in them they they name it uh, to, to ride the mountain of the Bec de Ross and here definitely it comes down to fun. It's more the tension to perform well because it's a one in a lifetime chance to compete in Haines, Alaska. Okay, well, it it is about fun, but at the same time, there is a lot of pressure on because we've got another cut coming up in the field. Let's take a look at the quota system now and how the field is cut over the season. <coughs> The full field compete in the first three events. So that's 28 ski men, 14 snowboard men, 14 ski women, and seven snowboard women. Using the athletes' best two results from the first three events, a cut is made here for the fourth event in Alaska to 14 ski men, seven snowboard men, seven ski women, and five snowboard men. Then, after that, we cut the field again using their best three results to 12 ski men, six snowboard men, six ski women, and four snowboard men. The athletes' best four results will then be used to crown the world champion. So while, while there is that element, as you say, of fun and playfulness to this face, there is a lot of pressure to get a good result here. Oh, yeah. Like, that's really that kind of comes into play. Everyone's looking at a fun line. They kind of, yeah, as, as we just said, it's, it's, a, it's a buffet of goodies that they can choose off. Uh, but then it comes into play, oh, damn it, I actually should ride well or win to have a chance for the title as it's coming up only one week after the here and uh, so that's that's definitely up their their mind one of one of the interesting parts is that we're taking at the moment the best three results from four so the way the guys approach this face will depend on what their throwaway result is as well, won't it? And especially in a category like ski men, you've got all of the leaders have got a couple of amazing results and one bad result. I think until you get down to fifth place with Leo Slemet, who has consistent results. So he actually has an advantage here. He can really send it without risking too much. That's correct. Uh, but uh, here definitely we have to mention that it, it comes down to the personalities of the riders. Uh, some just don't give it a well you you know well, what i mean yeah um they they just want to go and have fun but also perform to the highest level here and and some definitely will do more kind of the tactics game but we come closer when we see the ranking of the current standing then we can get more closely into that discussion well it's just flicked off but that was the program for the day kicking off with snowboard men then ski men then snowboard women and ski women uh yeah it's to go back to what you were saying marty sometimes some of the riders ride with their hearts some with their heads yeah definitely all riders have a huge heart for free riding but uh yeah you have some that are a little more competitive or from time to time, a little, little more competitive and some not. And it also depends on, as we said, about where they're currently ranked, uh, if they have the freedom to be relaxed or not. Okay, well, we're going to take a quick break now before we get stuck into the start.
this is the venue for today's competition. The format is snowboard men, ski men, snowboard women, ski women. The venue confusingly is eponymously called the venue because it hosted a snowboard contest earlier on when the Haynes was first being pioneered. One of the first ever contests was held up here. Now we're gonna kick off with the snowboard men. This is how the season has gone so far. Conspicuous by their absence here in Haynes, a 2014 world champion, Milian Badu, and Canadian tour stalwart, Jamie Rizzuto. The injured Sasha Ham is not here either. He took a huge fall at the last event in Fieberbrunn. Of the men who have traveled to Alaska, Sammy Lubke is the standout. He took first in both Chamonix and Fieberbrunn, and the all-rounder has a commanding lead at the top of the rankings. Two riders attempting to reel in his lead are Sammy's lifelong riding partner and impressive rookie Jonathan Penfield and the American powerhouse and 2013 tour champion Ralph Backstrom. The young French rider Camille Armand proved that he is a threat in Andorra. While the oldest and most experienced rider on the tour, Flo Orly, continues to enjoy his renaissance with a string of good results. So plenty to play for here, Marty. We've already made a cut in the field after the first three events. Another cut will be made after today's runs. So a lot of pressure on all of these guys. Absolutely. They already had to play the pressure game throughout the season. Here, definitely, there is another one with that cut. But I must say, here it's all about joy as well because uh, their main goal has been done to uh, qualify for next season. OK, well, we've got Camille Armand kicking things off. Then we're going to see Jonathan Penfield, Sammy Lubke, Chris Galvin, Ralph Backstrom, Flo Orley, Ryland Bell, Sasha Ham will not start because of that injury sustained in Fieberbrunn. But it's the young Frenchman, Camille Armand, who prepares himself now to make the first drop. Camille out of Chamonix, Mont Blanc. We've had a stage there, the second stage of the Freeride World Tour. That was a tough one for him. He had to perform well, of course, in front of his home crowd, but he was so sick the, the evening before. And I was very surprised how much energy he had in his run. And he, he did actually perform really well. So you can see, Camille, just a couple of last questions. We've had four guides down as four runners so far today. Conditions nearly perfect. A little shaded area at the bottom of the face. It's a little bit crispy, but it's predicted Camille to soften is off. Up. And he starts from the looker's right side, which is way steeper at the beginning. You can see some slough moving, but not too much for Alaska standards. We have one part of the spine a little more baked. You can see by the tracks that he left. He rode it super fluid at the top part. But I must say, we haven't seen any huge feature. But he's nailing that. Definitely channeled Xavier De La Rue out onto the uh, main face there. Arms held wide, yeah. straight lining it. But as you say, quite a conservative approach to the top section. Of course, this is a very, very steep section up there. So uh, conservative is uh, relative, but uh, it, uh, we will definitely see some more action in the top part of so other riders. A little bit variable now as he comes off that main face and down into the bottom zone. Big kicker here. This is where we saw Flo Orley and Sasha Ham going launching. far. Now it's beautiful control. The snow is perfect in there. Just starting to get more technical now as they come into the spine zone at the bottom of the face. I tell you, he went for the most joyable, joyable run you can do down this face. That was pure pleasure from Kami Amo. So. I'd say a very, very cruisy run there from Camille. There was nothing, yep. nothing, no major feature to speak of. As you said, he had a lot of fun, but it's going to be difficult watching the judges there for them to go out on a limb and really reward him there for. Let's let's run through the five categories. Uh, there he, we go. Here, we perfectly, we see that huge area that they can choose off, and he chose a. Uh, the very steep part from uh, the looker's right side start. 
and that top section really is a feature in itself as it's so steep. Here we see that part. Actually, he'd already come out of that um, crucial section where he had to drop into his line. So the fluidity and control working really well, but air and style, as we thought, and the line. Line yeah. almost not scoring. He's almost dropped an entire category there. Yeah, like uh, this means he's neutral. is not super positive, not super negative. Uh, uh, but as we mentioned already, while hi during his ride, that there were no major highlights of line choice. But uh, I tell you, he had <laughs> the most fun riding down that beautiful face. Okay, so Bertie Dernavo, Hugo Harrison, Tom Burt, Lolo Bess, uh, Dion Newport, legends of free riding, tasked with judging that run. They've given it 70 points. And as you see in any subjective contest, snowboarding or skiing, you get a range finding first score. The judges will put that one out there and a fairly standard run, but good solid riding all the way down. Nothing spectacular, but good solid riding. So Camille Armand, 70 points to start the men's snowboard category. And at this stage, it might be a good uh, position to, to explain. 70 points, uh, you should not compare that to 70 points in another contest. It's all about the ranking for the judges. So it comes down to the ranking in the end. What Five, kind of points four, they actually three, have, it does not two, reflect to one, another event or contest. Okay, so now the biochemist out of Palo Alto. He's, uh, he uses his holiday time off from his day job to come to the Freeride World Tour. There might be some uh, working mates, colleagues, being uh, online. So hello to them. Yeah, he's. Uh, they will be sitting in an office, and here <laughs> their mate, who is normally sitting next to them, is just no. riding some Alaska spines. He's tracked his way around behind these cornice sections. Now you can see the size of these cornices. All of those entry points are closed to the riders. They have here to he find comes. Their way in around those cornices. So Jonathan Penfield working his way into the middle of the face. Now and he's above a big cliff line here. Oh, yeah, that's the one George Rodney did as a double last year. A little bit of hesitation there. Oh, no. Going down. And that gives you an idea of the gradient now. The tomahawk does not let up. Back on his feet, though. The slough is uh, getting in his way. So, But he managed to get back in control. Was that a trick right after? Beautiful frontside <laughs> 360 out of seemingly nothing. And there's, there's two really good indicators out of this run that give you an idea of just how steep the face is at the top there. The number of times he tomahawked or went end over end, he couldn't arrest that fall because the gradient was so steep. And then off seemingly nothing, <laughs> he just popped up and was able to drop 12, 15 feet on a frontside 360. But what kind of mindset do you have when you just tomahawk down the face and probably still your snow, snow is full or the, the goggle is full of snow and you see that lip, ah, let's do another three. I'm really disappointed by this. Jonathan Penfield is one of the riders who I'd describe as having a quiet style. He's got a really nice, lazy approach to his riding. He makes it look so effortless. And that and fall. And still goes into very technical sections of the mountain. Beautiful double right there. Oh. Proving that he's here for a reason. But he told me that he already kind of uh, had the goal of the season in the bag, which is the requalification of next season. Another tumble there, unfortunately. But of course, it that doesn't damage his score too much anymore because he already had a huge fall at the top section. Yeah. The judges are looking, that comes under control, and that was a complete loss of control once you start tomahawking. Yeah, so. like from, from that tomahawk at the top, there was no way to, to score any points near the podium. Ah, oh, he's, th that, this <laughs> that's is a really, it's, it's not a reflecting his yeah. uh, riding abilities because it's so flat light up there. Probably his goggles are full of snow. He has been crashing twice already. What's, what's interesting, what you can take from that run though is just how many features he was able to put in there. Compare it to Camille's from before where he was coasting. You look at that and he had five big features picked out there. Here we have kind of the, ver the big variations, a perfect comparison to Camille's run, which was more to the skier's right. Here we have uh, the uh, Lucas left 
uh, sorry, the skiers left before from Camille Mo, and now we have the skiers right from Jonathan Penfield. And we're going to see quite a lot of traffic going through that section, I'm sure. Talking to the riders, they were really, uh, really impressed by the line choice of uh, George Rodney and uh, riding like uh, Sam Smoothie or uh, Jeremy Heights that went through the same section. Okay, next rider season. up at the top. Sammy Lubke, he's uh, one, another one of the score riders, Ralph Backstrom, Jonathan Penfield, Sammy Lubke, Rylan Bell, all ride at score. So he is Five, the current four, leader. If three, Sammy two, Lubke and one, wins, he was he in his position what? for some yeah. time Sammy. already in the past few years. Current leader, uh, somehow during the injury or bad luck, whatever, he just couldn't put it together to win the world title, and this year it is his year. I have the feeling so. He looks so strong, and having the chance to win it actually here in his kind of home turf. Lovely nose bone there off that cliff. If Sammy Lubka wins here, he will be crowned world champion. So a lot of pressure on Sammy. He's going for a big one there. Beautiful stomp. He finds the perfect pockets to jump into. Well, he's not pushing as hard. Oh, beautiful backside 360. He's not pushing as hard as Jonathan Penfield, but as you say, he's, this is a tactical run almost from Sammy. He knows conditions are variable at the bottom. He's got three lovely features already banked on that top section as he makes his way across that long section of face before we roll off again into the bottom features. wonder what he has on his ears. Is it Bob Dylan or... Creedence Clearwater. Bit of Grateful Dead, maybe. <laughs> Classic rock. Yeah. Here we go. So the bottom section, that's where it comes down. Is it all a winning round already? He's, that's Penfield's line next to him there. He's coming a bit slower. Taking his time through there. I think he might have seen Jonathan Penfield's bomb hole out of the bottom of that and thought, I'll just pull off the gas a little bit. Could be. Definitely he knows that he already has a good score in the back. And now with a strong finish, a little bit of hesitation, but it is not very easy to ride that because there is it's pretty rollery. So uh, there, there are hardly any points of uh, landmarks that you can take. Now, we, we've talked about this before, Marty. We're seeing that's exactly the same line by a couple of points that uh, Jonathan Penfield took. This is the point magnet, isn't it? People are looking in there for those heavy point scoring runs and it's going to be someone brave who Whoever moves nice away move. from this that was beautiful yeah so he he used that top section it couldn't have done any better like every feature was in there uh riding the spines slough management coming out with a big drop and then a transfer 360 and that was even half of his run only. This this score is going to be very painful for Jonathan Penfield to look at High 80s, he's cracked the 90 mark. Sammy Lubke, a fantastic score as he hand jives his way into the finish area. And Jonathan Penfield knows he'd had a little more exposure. He took some bigger risks at the top. His score could have been stratospheric if he'd landed it. But Sammy Lubke boxes clever, takes his time and lands the best run of the day so far. Only three people in though. Next up is Christopher Galvin. If you're just joining us, this is the fourth stop of the Freeride World Tour here in Haines, Alaska. Perfect conditions. The men's snowboard category is the first category of the day, and this is the fourth rider, Christopher Galvin. Pretty sure Christopher will go into a similar aspect of the face. Him and Sammy are one of the best friends for years. They've been riding together in the Tower area for kind of ever. Galvin as well, and one of the riders who came into Fieberbrunn needing a podium to, uh, to, stay, to make the cut here for the event in Haines, and he did that. He squeaked in with a third. So hopefully that's built his confidence and he's going to ride on that as he comes in now. Now he's cut around the back of the corner section again. And he's going to He's appear. a rider that I know that doesn't put any pressure on himself. So he's he gonna rides for the joy of it. He loves that 
fresh snow like anyone else, everyone else. Cutting in exactly where we saw Penfield fall. Can he make it where Jonathan Penfield didn't? Yes, he can, but he's carrying a lot of speed now that he needs to kill. He's done that beautifully off that little wind lip. Coming into that bottom section where we've seen another two airs of Sammy. Can he kind of do the count of, uh, of features just like Sammy? There was another feature there coming into that 360 area. Hopefully not getting disturbed. Ah, he lost a little bit of speed there from the debris. So interesting, just doing the maths on the judging now, trying to work out where these are going to differ. Sammy had packed in three features by this stage, but there's a big line. Oh, oh no! He hit that debris slough area and just uh, couldn't put it together. Damn. I don't think the line had flowed to the same level of Sammy. Even if he'd made that, I don't think there was more consequence. He'd landed Jonathan's yeah, that, run. That, but that top section, that top air was huge. The double definitely would have put him up there. But you're right that the kind of overall impression of that top section was not as fluid as Sammy's. This is a huge face. Oh, beautiful drop there. It is such a big face. It's about holding your focus for the entire run, isn't it? So many features. Your legs have got to stay strong. Your brain has got to stay focused as you try and make your way down through really three stages of and face. And here we have another 360. Beautiful terrain usage from Christopher. Such a style, stylish rider. So Chris Galvin and Jonathan Penfield both pushing the envelope and paying the price. Difficult lines that they fell on, so we won't see scores for them. The only people so far to have a big landed run on the score sheet are Camille Armand, who uh, was very conservative, and then Sammy Lubka, who pushed it in all the right places and yeah. has banked 90 points. And here, this could be an, an interesting example. Here we have that top double, very technical, steep, controlling the speed right there. This is textbook. Big mountain riding. That was slough management. He as was well. so compact off the second double, wasn't he? He kept his body completely tucked up. And here up. we have the fall. You see that avalanche debris coming in? His nose just got caught and couldn't resist falling. For me, that was a classic case of almost being too slow. Where you want to try and play it safe and you end up riding slowly and you actually get hung up or bogged in that landing. If he'd have had a bit more speed there, I think he would have punched through that. Could easily be, yeah. And this could be a perfect example of having a conservative line just like Kami, or let's call it the playful run without big features of Kami before, and Chris Galvin, who really put himself out there with this huge drop at the top in this very steep area, and then another 360 at the top. Here we have him being very close to the, to the score of Kami Amon. Well, it, it gives you an idea of just how within himself Camille rode that he scored a 70 on a clean run. And then Chris Galvin, with all of that exposure on the double at the top and a fall, was still able to get close to him. Exactly. Now, the powerhouse out of Squaw Valley, Ralph Backstrom, 2013 Tour champion. Such a steady style. I spent a bit of time free riding with Ralph up here last just year. strong guy. Oh, it's so His powerful. His legs are... Stomping legs, I would say, because he can l make look big features, big drops look like nothing. So just he loves that toe side drop and then really digging the edge in to kill some speed. First feature. Very fluid. No. Over the handlebars. Just like he usually wants to stomp it. He's not going for that back slap, back slash. Um, or spin out of the board. He always wants to have, we, as skiers, we call it four-point landing. Don't know why it's the snowboarding expression. Just but centered. Yeah, Getting very centered, centered, centered over the landing. Board. Yeah. That's his style, and he wanted to go for it again, unfortunately, going over the bars. These days, with your rocker profile on the nose of a snowboard, so you've got the rocker starting from under your front foot, that, that wants to stay up, and you don't need to set your stance back quite as far, so you can use the nose, a bit more surface area on the nose, to hold you up. But Ralph just... But the run is not finished. As we said, this is a huge face. And very steep in through there. Probably not risking it too much anymore. Still an event to come but enjoying it. Oh, 
beautiful speed, just gliding over sections there. The board just touching down in places. And the snow looks perfect. So happy that the riders have the best conditions they could be offered. Well, that was almost like watching a speed rider. You can imagine, you know it's steep when someone's gliding over the snow like they've got a parachute on their back. Yeah. That was phenomenal. Beautiful bottom section from Ralph Backstrom, unfortunately let down by that fall on the cliff. So you can see really good fall line descent as well. Fall line means uh, the route that water Here would take. Here we have the crucial part. He went for the centered landing and had two cartwheels, two tomahawks, and he is gutted. You can see that because he had a line in planned out that could be a potential winning line. And then he went for the joy ride at the end with this, yeah, the best pockets in this bottom skiers right side of the venue. Well, he was ranked third coming into this event, so I think that, oh, that was beautiful, wasn't yeah. it? Such good control <laughs> of that speed. A lot of people start to panic, and if at that kind of speed, if you dig your heel edge in, you're just gonna start bouncing. So Scores coming in, and of course, not gonna be the best because of that crash at the top section. So, Ralph Backstrom will have to sit tight. Currently ranked third. He should have strong enough results. A fourth from Valnor Arcalis, a third from Chamonix, and a ninth from Fieberbrunn to carry him through and qualify for Verbier. At the moment, it's Camille Arnain and Flo Orly, I think, battling it out on the bubble. Christopher Galvin as well. That fall could cost him a place in Verbier. Back up to the top though, and it is the man in his penultimate freeride world tour event. He is retiring at the end of 2016. Hence, he is celebrating by riding in a gorilla suit. He lets the animal out of him in his last season on tour. The veteran, this man is above 40 and he's still rocking hard on any surface on this planet. Doesn't mess around, straight into the first feature. Made that that is very steep section there. And he made it look good. He just floated Great. off that cliff. The landing was lovely. So he gets into another one. No hesitation whatsoever. And now full speed over that flat part. Already being stoked about having a good top section. As you can see, the gorilla suit, not that aerodynamic there. It's actually <laughs> it w working as an air brake for him. He's used to face jumping and Probably had a, a wingsuit on once or twice in his life, and it must have feel very similar coming on over that that what do you call it apron? Yeah, the apron. It's kind <laughs> of the the big. Oh, now he's making his way. Comes for a trans transfer, and this is Beautiful the kicker grab. he hit last year. Sasha Ham and Flo uh, smashed this ridge last year. Going for it again with a grab. Oh, huge! Ian sticking it. Double the length of uh, Camille Armand's effort from earlier on, and now he's into this lovely technical spine section. And there's a cliff here. Another very steep section at the bottom there. Beautiful line for Flo Orly. That is, v oh, and he's, he's fallen at the bottom there. Yes, it's completely in the shade. Now, there's, there's been discussions about this. Once you make the glacier at the bottom of the face, you're not being judged, and he is right on the edge there. Going to be interesting to see whether tricky, that's a yeah. judged section. But what a beautiful line. It had everything in there. Very steep and technical riding at the top. You can see that very steep section with spines and the, the drop at the top. And then getting into that flowy section, flow early section, uh, with the transfer and then getting into that air that he was known for l from last year, going bigger than anyone else. So this in the 45 degree region, in places steeper up at the top there, and you could see it in those landings. Oh, the control has been judged, he's down in the orange there. So that loss of control at the bottom is going to cost that him. That was a huge air on that roller. And here we have where things gone wrong. First, everything under control, right there. And then, unfortunately, in that flat light at the bottom of the way, you, it's really hard to understand, but although it's sunny all around, but
but that shady part you don't have any contours that you can actually see where what where the tra uh, the trainee is coming so 73.3 still a half decent score and it's above Camille Armand so Flo Orly really disappointed by I that. hope that he didn't hurt himself or maybe hopefully it's only his pride that got hurt so Ryland Bell, the wild card for the event here in Alaska. He's a fisherman during the summer. Heads south for the winter to Squaw to ride with Galvin, Ludke and Backstrom. Super powerful, very, very smooth rider. What a gang they have up here. Four riders of your home mountain riding together all year round and then you come up for a competition in Alaska. He is hyped. Uh, you can see how relaxed he is as well. He's just getting his groove on, settling into his mojo. And when they ride together so my, many times, I um, wouldn't be big time surprised if they choose similar lines. Yeah, they'll definitely have been discussing these, and it's it's a big point scorer. We've already seen that uh, Jonathan Penfield and Chris Galvin both cranked through their points we're going to take a quick break now uh, we're just watching waiting on flow all his condition but we'll be back with you as soon as we have any news So, news on Flo Orley, he is okay, no problem there. Ryland Bell, claiming it, punching both hands towards the sky. He's ready for his run. He is on start number one, which is the looker's left side of the face. So, same starting point as Christopher Galvin, Jonathan Penfield and Sammy Lubke. Edge his way out. Probably and best known. Ryland on course. Here we have some lo local knowledge. Probably lovely frontside 360 at the top there. Got a grab on it. And then arcing along that ridge there into a little drop. Beautiful usage of terrain up there. 360 again. Beautiful. Frontside and backside 360s so far, making the most of this terrain. Super solid again on that frontside air. Oh, and he's hyped, yes. You saw the fists <laughs> yeah. clench up and woo! firing down there. Loving it. Cranky, a lovely heel side turn there, killing a bit of speed as he comes up onto this bowling ball as the terrain rolls away out of sight. Still, he needs a strong finish to get his friend Sammy off the top of the ranking at the moment. Well, and if he can, then he's going to delay the world championship, the world champion title being awarded to Sammy. Another beautiful transfer there. Chucks out of method. The most stylish. Tricking Snowboy, another little drop down at the bottom there. I think this is a big score. Oh, yeah. This could be kind of the, the party 
interrupter yeah, or I'm the spoiler or what do, we, what do you call them? I think Sammy Lubka might be having words with his friend here. Wedding crasher. Two 360s <laughs> right up at the top of the face there. Really, really high consequence moves on a steep section of face. I think he's challenging the judges not to really elevate his score there. Yeah, I would I would have him in the in the top position. It's going to be tough for Sammy, but uh, and uh, I'm very sure Sammy's relaxed enough to to give him give him the win if it's so. Here we have the highlights with a 360 coming out of it. Look at these scores. Look at the green lines there. Body language, and that's the the bottom section which is strong as well. Less hesitation as Sammy had. Yep. So, and another feature like this transfer backside air and another method. So, here comes the score. Watch this rise. It's powered its way through the set. Yes. Oh, yes. 95 <laughs> points for Ryland Bell. It is first place as the last rider down. And he delays the crowning of the world champion, Sammy Lubka, until Verbier. He has ruined the party. Sammy Lubka. I'm sure we'll be having <laughs> words with his friend. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that to me? I was so close. Yeah. We've talked about this a lot. Sammy Lubke has always been the bridesmaid. He's so talented, but whether it's conditions or just bad luck, injuries, something has always stopped him claiming the title. This year has always felt like his year, but Ryland Bell, the fly in the ointment there for... Sammy Lubka pushing him into second place. Flo Orley in third. Camille Armar in fourth. Christopher Galvin, Ralph Backstrom and Jonathan Penfield all suffering at the hands of the top of the face there with a fall. Sasha Ham did not start. So confirmation of those men's results. Fantastic start to the day here in Haynes, Alaska. Great snow. A really, really challenging face that's offering so much potential, so yeah. many options. Let's take a look at the overall standings. Sami Lubke has claimed his first ever Freeride World Tour Championship here in Alaska, so Verbier will be a victory lap for him. Jonathan Penfield's fall means that he misses out on pushing Sami, but still claims second place. Ralph Backstrom in third, Camille Armand in fourth. Flo Orley's position has moved up to fifth and Christopher Galvin has moved into sixth position. Good enough to qualify for Verbier ahead of the injured Sasha Ham. He won the first stop in Andorra with Sasha Ham. And what a run. run, what an opening for a season. Big drop at the bottom. It was not easy to ride, it was shallow. A lot of rock sticking out. He made the best out of it. This is Haynes. Everyone's here. Everyone is missing you. You made a mistake. But we will see you back here next year. Woo! Hey, Sasha. Sasha, the Sekel, has been aber ordentlich in Schrecken gejagt. I want to see you snowboarding again. Send you all the best and I hope that you can visit me soon. Hope you're doing well, man. Okay, also gesund werden and bis bald. Sasha Ham, we're gonna go ham. I love you, my man. Get well. Uh, everyone very disappointed not to have Sasha here. He's you think he's watching? Undoubtedly. Um, <laughs> if from his hospital bed in Salzburg, I think he was gonna start rehab in Vienna. Um, no lasting damage, thankfully, for Sasha, but certainly for me, one of the biggest crashes I've seen on the Freeride World Tour. Oh yeah, that was... Uh chill factor it really really was a frightening moment but uh very very happy that you're getting back in shape will take a little while but you're going to be back that's for sure we'll look forward to seeing you next year sash right we're now moving on to the ski men's category uh we have got 14 skiers the level of talent in this field is phenomenal isn't it marty oh yeah just have a look at who didn't make the cut that is actually so impressive to see. Sam Smoothie really tried hard with the, those creative lines that we know of him. Also George Rodney, form, the world champion from last year, coming in his rookie year. And one of the best all-round skiers on this planet, Sam Antamatten out of Switzerland, Zermatt, didn't make the cut. Whereas Louis Colombato, with his rookie win on the Tour 2014, coming back, back in form, and leading the pack into the Alaska stop. Followed by not, 
no one else, another rookie on a roll. Christopher Tudel out of Sweden and the youngster Logan Pahoda out of Whistler, Canada, making his uh, famous name Pride and uh, being at the top of the ranking. We're coming to those last two stops here in Haines, Alaska, and Verdier coming up soon. Brendan Barker, Jeremy Hyde, two of the other riders who are within touching distance of the overall rankings podium. Jeremy Hyde's there. No stranger to the word speed. <laughs> Absolutely. Last year he probably broke the world record in free ride events of speed while his run in Verbier at the finals. So those are the current rankings now. Loic Colum Patton can take the win here in uh, Haynes if Pejota and Turdell are not in the top three. And if Loic comes second, he is world champion if Jeremy doesn't win and uh, Logan and Christopher Turdell aren't top five. So few different permutations there, but Loic Colum Patton will know he can make he can finish the season off here and take the world championship with a solid run. So this is the start list. Heights, Barcred, Lopez, Pejota, Rizval uh, and Maya. Then Loic, Colin Patton in the middle of the field there. Christopher Turdell, Malakoff, Slemet, Studer, Tabke and Felix Vimas is going to round out the ski men. 14 skiers and you always say this, it's a cliche, but any one of them could win. Yeah, literally. It is a cliche, but it is a fact. Uh, we have such a strong field of riders there, and they have been riding in ton of terrains. Of course, we have a lot of uh, kind of different ages. We have from 21, 22 years old to uh, close to 40, and in this in this pack. But uh, every one of them is still pretty experienced in what they do, and one of them is the Swiss prodigy. Jeremy Heights, known for his speed. The fluidity is always up there, and it's one of the few chances he has to drop in first as a skier. Not the first rider to go down. We have seen the snowboard category go down already, and he's aiming for a similar terrain that we've seen him go down last season. Now, we've discussed he this. In If there's one thing that you thought He's going huge of that one that oh he took already last goodness. year. It is the same. No. And he is going down big time. Exploded through there at about 50 miles an hour. Jeremy Heights up on his feet straight he away. Is. Give he us a wave. He's okay. Yes, he's okay. There's the wave. It's look, trademark look at that Heights again. though. Huge drop, probably a little further than he wanted to. And then, oh no, he hit that debris in that outrun. It's a yard sale after that. It's skis and poles are everywhere. The good thing is we have some fresh snow. It is like pretty soft. Of course, if you hit soft snow with uh, 130K, it might be not as soft anymore. But uh, Jeremy Heights will now be relying on some of the snowboard men who have been flown back up to the top and will get to enjoy another run as they go in to collect his ski. What I was going to say up at the top there, we discussed this at length in the build-up to this, Marty. Jeremy Heights is consistently top five, but he cannot get the wins. What do you think he needs to do to start winning? Oh, if that, that's the great thing. You're exactly right. We have seen him five times in second place over the last few years. That is impressive. And uh, always in the top ranking. And we've never seen a win, as you said, but this year we've seen in Chamonix that he's stepping up his game. Unfortunately, it didn't work well because of the last drop that he did, huge one. Again, kind of a, a little counter face or counter knob of the, the, the landing zone he hit in, in Chamonix. But we've seen a huge backflip of him, the first one of its kind of him in the contest. I've seen him doing them several times in the back country, so he's super comfortable, and there he did a huge one. And that's definitely what he needs to do to step up the game in terrain that is not perfect for his signature style of riding, which is going humongously fast. Okay, well, if you're just joining us, this is the venue. We've got two starts there and a huge face. You've got the finish line at 1,360 meters, so about 
3,900 feet. Uh, and then you've got Little Jarvis Glacier. So there are crevasses just down under that central buttress at the bottom. So the riders and uh, skiers are all traversing right, lookers right, to get out the finish line. 740 meters of vertical drop there, Martin. That is a lot. We have to start at 2,100. And uh, this is the biggest vertical drop that we have all season. Uh, Verbier comes close to it with just above 600 meters of vertical, uh, but here definitely is even one size bigger. East to northeast, that's why we have some sun in the face at the moment. Uh, f uh, unfortunately, it's going to fade. Hopefully, uh, we're going to be able to finish that event before everything is in the shade or the, the clouds come in. We've got really good snowpack. Uh, 10, 15 centimeters of new snow from uh, 36 hours ago. That's sloughing lightly, but certainly for start two, there is some incredibly steep terrain up there in, in excess of 45 degrees. And we can take a closer look at that now with the GoPro first look. So here we are in Alaska. Hello from McFly. We're here just opposite the venue called The Venue. We were quite busy to use this little weather window to bring up all the stuff and prepare the tents. Unfortunately, the weather didn't allow me to ride the face today. This little roadhouse just behind me, the mile 33, is the base camp for the waiting game. Here, the riders are waiting to get up in the mountains to do one run just before the event. Instead, I'm going to ask some riders what they're going to expect for tomorrow, and we're going to show you some runs of last season. Yeah, last year I was dropping first in the ski main category, so I was super lucky actually, and had amazing powder. Um, the face is super fun, it's hard to decide where to go, there's so much to do. There are some sections uh, that are really steep up here and um, the snow sticks pretty good so we are, um, it's, it's a chance for us to ski some really nice funny stuff so we don't have somewhere else in the world. Alaska is special. It looks fun but it's a very long run so um, I think it will be tough in the end and some parts of the face are not that easy, easy to see where to go so it's a little bit uh, hard to find the right direction. Yeah, on, on this face in Alaska, it's, it's different than Europe. Uh, it's more spiny, more shoulders. Uh, in Europe, you have to ski more in the couloirs, and here you can go on the spines and play with some pillows. And uh, slough is, of course, very a big thing here in these big mountains. Uh, also, when you have riders before you, they start slough, and then in your outrun, you maybe have big slough debris waiting for you, so you have to calculate that in your line choice, and makes it interesting, different, but uh, very, very cool, because, yeah, it's, it's, it's not really, not only about the result, it's also about having a great run in Alaska. That was the sound of Flo Orley coming second last year. And what you see now is Jeremy Heights skiing down on one ski and making a pretty good job of it. If I could ski powder on two skis that well, I'd be pretty stoked. I think they're each on one ski, aren't they? Both the uh, whoever's come down to grab him is on one ski and Jeremy's on one ski. So they're obviously sharing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is some of the most tiring thing you can do riding on one ski those are true athletes they are training all year long just to ride a few of those faces during the season and it's no mean feat because getting down off the apron jeremy crashed in the top section of features and the apron is easily skiable on one ski but trying to get out through that steeper bottom section on one ski is not an easy task <laughs> no 
Okay, so what a shame. Here we have. Oh, Rainer we Barker have on course. So the opener for Rainer. We missed him, sorry. Here we have Rainer on the skier's left side with a big drop exiting into the apron. Just gently laying out some turns as he comes down onto this huge face and gives us great bit of context of just how big this mountain is. As we know him, perfect stumps all of his career, probably the most constant and consistent, ri consistent rider, not only on tour, but ever. The yeah. He's definitely heading into that same zone that we saw Flo Orley airing off before. And he's taking some speed. Oh, this ever. could go far. Yep, controlled. Probably was thinking about, should I do a backflip? Should I do, should I do? No, maybe not. And you can see him just a little bit skinny on that ridge. You can see some of the older tracks and lovely. That's exactly where Sasha Ham got hung up last year, airing into that very narrow little chute. Yeah. And, but Rene managed to just trim it in and pull the fall line as he came out of it. Very, very strong run from Rene Barkred. So yeah, Rainer's big strength, be be besides many others, is that he, he can adjust in milliseconds to new situations. I could imagine that he tried actually to hit that in a different angle, but he saw the snow conditions um, being a little more variable than he wanted it to be. That's just my guess. And uh, he kind of chose a just a different uh, kind of takeoff spot than he, he was originally planning. Here we have the top section that's coming out of it but he already had an air uh, at the very top where we unfortunately missed him and here beautiful angle of that roller he could have gone a little further that's yeah, what he definitely, definitely will save to himself when he re the life so <laughs> this is going to be after jeremy heights fell this is going to be our trademark score the range finder 78 the rainy bar cred so 12 skiers still left to drop though and the Swede from Aura is going to have to watch them all nervously. This man, joint champion in 2009, Julian Lopez. He's on his final round. We call it Ehrenrunde. What is that like when you do the, the final lap or the, an extra lap? Victory. Victory lap. So he is on that victory lap after competing for many years. He didn't make the cut last year. He was so gutted to not come to, to Alaska with us. He's here with us. He had two runs yesterday in a free session with a heli and he performed a huge backflip. You couldn't be he couldn't be more happy to, to have that in the bag already. Everything else is a plus and he is on a party run. Not only the whole season, but this in particular. So the 34 year old focusing on his hotel and restaurant Mama Jane, and he runs in Ace Le Bain. As he comes in, ooh, this was Heights, did this as a single. Penfield and Galvin did it as a double. He's shutting down the speed very wisely and going into another huge pocket there, taking it as another double with the backflip as we know him. Stick it, yes! <laughs> you saw that punch. Oh, he's pumped. That is a big, big confidence boost at the top there the double into a big backflip loving it now keep it together he will not he will not play any tactics he goes for another yep lovely transfer yes just enough speed to make to clear that little shoot that wind lip if he gets another strong finish that will be a top score for sure Look what how relaxed he is. He's yeah. really enjoying this run, isn't he? And this is what f shows through in free riding. You can make all the preparation, you can play all the tactics you want, but if you're not enjoying the run, if you're not flowing, then it's not going to look good. And Julien, the Frenchman, was always, throughout his career, good for a show. When you knew he is on the go, then uh, it's up for a big show. He is nailing down. Unfortunately, he didn't get another feature, bigger feature in at the bottom. This, this could have bumped up his score even further. We'll see what the judges will say about that, but that top section was unbelievable. Yeah, so much consequence. 
if you're going to go for big tricks, you, if you shove them in, because the way this face, as you look at it there, you can see these ridges down on the bottom. If you're doing big tricks down there, great, but you're not risking as much as Julian did on that top section. The double into that huge backflip to open is just, yeah. the judges cannot ignore that. Here we have the top double, wisely not taking it as a single to have not an too much speed and here comes the huge backflip. See how far he travels down and stomps it perfectly. And he didn't hesitate. That was a difficult entry to that cliff. That was a little transfer and a slab at the bottom, a spray. I'm, I'm really glad we saw that. That sunny south facing side of that wind lip, you could see how heavy the snow was coming off that then. Yep. So it's definitely, we're getting changed snow conditions down at the bottom of the face. It's getting a little bit heavier now. So something to watch out for. All the guys we have a new leader with Julian Lopez, 83.66. Great score for him to in his first year competing in Alaska. So the Frenchman, very, very happy with that run. Next up, it's the young Canadian, Logan Peyota, who's been enjoying his maiden season on the Freeride World Tour with fourth place in Val Noir Calais, second in Chamonix. 13th in FIBA run, so a disappointment, but those first two results working hard for him, the second and the fourth, but he needs a good result here. If he doesn't get a good result, Five, and he's relying on that 13th four, place from FIBA run, then he two, could drop out one, of the top 12. Yeah, but he has all the skills in the bag. He can make it happen in his first year. Interesting. And if not so, definitely his uh, prime, like first goal of the year to make the cut for next season. He was on a wild card to come here and he proved that he deserves that spot. So again, this points magnet that is the double cliff is where everyone's headed. Make short work of the double, a little bit smaller and almost goes over. He managed to cling to one ski. It's exactly the same line just as Julian Lopez. Taking it a little smaller, but more aggressive, I would say, to approach. And getting in another drop on the skiers left with a 360. Beautiful top section with three features, big ones. Not using the firework approach that Julian did, but he's packed that top section. Yeah, very technical riding. Unbelievable, the skill that he, this young man has already. Definitely living also of what he got taught by his dad, Eric, one of the legends of our sport. So this is the product of growing up in the back country, 21 years old, and he's got the kind of experience that most 30 year olds would die for. Make his way out onto a new section of this really steep bottom face, getting sloughed through there, but holding on. What a technical section and hold it together. Maybe went wanted to go for a three, but he did a nice safety grab there. And I think that made his way all the way to the top for the current situation because uh, Julian missed the bottom part. He had maybe with that big backflip a stronger big, uh, upper part, although the 360 in the end of uh, Logan kind of equalized that as well. And uh, I'm pretty sure this is the top run for for now. It'll be a great indicator on the judges from the judges to see where they put those uh, three hits versus the two massive ones because Logan definitely scaled back the double and he was a lot smaller and no backflip. But here we have the first double coming into it, super fluid. Boom, a little bubble there, but got his thing, yeah, his stuff together Recovered just in time. So fast. And here definitely more technical, not as far, but it had a reason to shut down another, uh, some speed to get to that 360 that we didn't see. Unfortunately, here we have the result of 90 points. He will be pleased with that. Very. And I would not be surprised if that's the winning line of today. I, For me, the standout part of that line was the bottom section, his control as it sloughed to make it across that little face and out onto that nose. The top yeah. was great, but that bottom section for me showed that he's got a great freestyle background and he's got incredible big mountain smarts. Oh yeah, he just showed the full package, you're right. Good slough management, great technical skiing. Logan Peota moves into first position with a very strong 90 points. Back up to the top again, and it's the Norwegian Dennis Rizval from Lemon Lake. The, uh, 
he's one of the riders who really needs he's got one standout result so he has to get a strong result here yeah but uh, he's always a guy going all or nothing and now even more with his current rankings he made the cut for next year that was probably his main goal as many other riders as well and he's going full throttle in that steep section up there yeah. and going a you know, huge transfer what oh my no. god no just not he just couldn't hold on to that now this is this is exactly where you get into <laughs> Alaskan that was nuts that was absolutely crazy are you kidding me that was I mean that was we've talked about this with Dennis before that he is always prepared to take a risk <laughs> yeah. he won't hold back and if it's a choice between something conservative and something big and showy's going to go big and showy but for yeah. me and that showed a certain amount of naivety on Alaskan gradients naivety or just uh, yeah uh, uh, kind of textbook example of his personality go big or go home and uh, of course he was not me uh, meant to go in yeah land into that rippy section probably just missed it by uh, I mean some I degrees I of angle I need to see a replay angle. but yeah. I thought he was aiming for something a setup transfer at 25 feet what he ended up with looks like it was I think difficult to see because the camera was moving, but it looked like a 50 foot transfer. Yeah, could easy be. That then easy. just started bouncing through two and three. And, and he's not finished. Another it's a massive party run. one. Oh, that's, that's really disappointing. That would have been one of the most outrageous lines I think yeah. I've ever seen if he could have held on to it. And that's what it is with Dennis. Like, uh, when he gets his line together, it is a pot like not only a potential, mm, probably a top three line every time. I want to hear from Mike Weyerhaeuser just to see whether that was intentional or if he really meant to go that big or if it was... I yeah. th Because he, he did... If he didn't mean to do that, he held on to it incredibly well. Absolutely. And he certainly didn't yeah. put a check in. He just yeah, started yeah. bouncing through the next sections. So, so steep, that top section. So steep. And it was, he was setting it, setting it up. He could have done a feature on the top before that, but uh, he knew that he has to concentrate on exactly that transfer. And he, he does, he does backflips literally in his sleep. There is probably no one out there who does more backflips a day. <laughs> <laughs> the backflip per day quota is high. Yeah, and. Uh, so I wouldn't wouldn't be surprised if he planned on doing a backflip on that transfer, but probably the s snow is quite baked, cooked on that uh, takeoff zone. Uh, could be a reason why he went for a straight air, which was wise because he didn't land probably in the section that he wanted to. So but Stefan <laughs> Hausel, 39-year-old from Strengen, I'm Alberg. You know Stefan pretty well, Martin. Yeah, we've been riding together, and he's a good good mate of mine and what a strong rider from the very beginning on the tour he was on a roll and he is now watch him really aggressive entry. same line as last year signature very compact rider one of the strongest legs we have in this field he's splitting those skis for purchase really well isn't he and going far <laughs> That's the good thing about this apron. You have kind of a run out where you can lose speed after. But that was really, really fast riding there. Anyone in their late 30s or early 40s wondering why they've got a diminished appetite for risk can take a leaf out of Stefan Hausel's book. The 39-year-old absolutely powering through that top section of the face. That was beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And th this is based on pure motivation and joy for skiing. Another transfer like there. Good friend Flo Early had the same thing, and he's going full throttle, a little bit off axis there. Yep. Yeah. The telltale he waggle of the poles <laughs> there. There was a little bit of panic wobble as he came over. <laughs> yeah. Now he's following Rainer Barkrid's line. Just killing speed as he comes into this technical. So easy to get caught out here. Ooh, he's going through that shoot. Yes, that's the tricky part to kind of in the in the train at the bottom. When it gets flat again, now luckily the, the visibility is way better than we had with Flo earlier in the beginning where he crashed because of the flat light. I Stefan put it together. 
I think in German you say grosser Pflaume. Grosser Pflaume, what? Big plums. <laughs> Big plums. <laughs> Stefan Hausel, take a bow. That was a fantastic <laughs> line. I really, really enjoyed that. I, for me, this is something that I know Tom Burt prioritizes in his judging, is the energy. And the moment Stefan came out, he was just attacking. There was this aggressiveness. Look at these max down. in line, big up there. Yeah, he wanted to go a little further on that one, I'm pretty sure. And here, surfing and challenging his slough. You have to be fast in these mountains because the slough is it too. You had everything in there, got some good air and style up at the top. There was good fluidity. Then the technical control through that bottom section was evident as well. That's his signature stuff, that he is such a technical strong rider. Next one up. We have not the score yet in from Stefan. I think maybe. Is there a 76.66 on that? 30 seconds. That is. Is it already? Yep, here it comes. 76.66. So in sits fourth just place behind Barkred. Disappointment for Stefan. I think for me the energy certainly was the standout of that. Now back up to the top, Benny Mayer. Started out as a freestyler. Five, moved into four, filming and slowly three, through his filming two, career transitioned one, from that dropping. slope star rider into an accomplished big mountain rider. And his goal was very clear to make a name of himself as a big mountain rider as well. But of course, trying to make the cut, coming same as Logan Pohoda on tour as a wild card, and well deserved. We've seen strong, strong riding of him in, uh, especially in Chamonix. We we talked through the other day strengths and weaknesses. He said it. My strength is that I'm not scared. My weakness is actually amazingly freestyle. He said because it's getting used to not having a manicured takeoff. Ooh, he just hit that edge. He caught it beautifully. Transfer from the side and caught oh. the nose. Ah, that's unlucky. That was a very creative approach to that segment that we've seen so much traffic on already. Yeah, everyone knows that is what you, you said this at the start of the week. It's one of those lines that everyone knows is the big point scoring line. So you head there and if you land your line through there, then you're going to have a top five position. Here we see what happened. He just barely touched that edge of that double and then came in from the side which was probably his plan and luckily we didn't see his fall or we see I'm sorry his fall but not the landing he has skis got both came of his off. skis though so he'll be back up there won't be any delay on this run oh. but as the judges mark down on control that was a complete loss of control so it's a throw away for Benny Mayer the legs of steel one of the legs of steel founding members it's going to be interesting to talk to him afterwards uh, if that kind of after that double was his original plan to do that transfer or was it just improvised because of uh, kind of getting into this section with too much speed. But he's not done yet. There's half of the run left and we don't get too much riding in here while waiting in Alaska. It's a really Iraq nervous. Surrounded by most beautiful mountains. So he might take a few nice laps and maybe uh, another trick in there if right, the camera is it's on. It's a nervous wait for him now because he is sat in 12th place in the rankings. And that solid run from Julian Lopez, who's in 13th, will almost certainly push him out. Now back up to the top and it here is we have the, the current cast GoPro live view that we have from Colomb. Louis Colomb Baton, world champion in 2014 on his rookie year. So he Five, is current tour leader. Four. A win here Two, could, one. with Christopher Turdell and Logan Peota's runs, see him claim the world championship. Uh, comes in with plenty of speed, dancing through those first couple of turns. New approach for the skiers. We've seen some snowboarders like Ralph Backstrom right there, his bomb hole. Beautiful In that transfer. section. Very good snow. You can see the shadow of his slough as he slays that, lays into that turn. Going to a big 360, stomping it beautifully. And he's cutting hard to make these lines, isn't he? he wants these features, perfect control. As he dances through, he's making this line pay top to bottom. It, the apron that we've seen separating everyone else's lines 
further over on the right hand side isn't a factor for Loic. He's got feature after feature after feature. He knows this area. He's been riding there last year where he exploded on one of the big cliffs. This is kind of the revenge line. Beautifully, as you just said, he was dancing down that mountain. Just holding feature on. feature after feature. The debris there, the slough debris out of the bottom as he comes into the variable condition areas. That, for me, you can see he's worked that main ridge and it was just packed with features. There wasn't the straight line that you see from the skiers and snowboarders on the right-hand side of the face. He was really working that. If anything, I think he maybe, yeah, there you go, Six. look at that. Critical points all the way down that line. And we had, I counted, six major features in there. Unbelievable. But none of them quite as impressive as the double at the top. There was the big 360 cliff. Uh, the cliff. Yeah, the, the problem is also that he, everything he makes looks so easy. The, the reception, the stumps, they had, you see that? Like that it's just like boom, yeah. it, as if it would be just a little floater. And uh, that's super impressive to see. We've seen some winning lines of him in the past, exactly done similar with similar style. This is going to be a very, be a very important decision by yeah. these guys now. Exactly. We have kind of opening a new segment or a new zone for the skiers. Here comes the score. Pushing into the 88, very close to Logan Pahoda. He still stays on top. The Canadian still in the lead. Well, the big news from that result and that score is that the World Tour will be decided in Verbier. Logan Peota up there in first position. Loic Colin Patton in second, cannot claim the world title here. Julian Lopez, fantastic run from him. We'll see him qualify at the moment as it stands for Verbier, pushing Benny Mayer out. Next in, Christopher Turdell, <laughs> the rookie who had the fairy tale start in Andorra. He took the win Five, there. Four, Been a difficult three, season for him two, after that. One, this in. pack of riders that we have right here is kind of the crucial part of the current tour standings. So we already have seen two of the top guys with Loic and Logan throwing down. At the moment, they're as close as they can get with 100 points apart in the overall standings. Christopher Turdell has a lot riding on this, though. If he falls here, he will be using a 22nd place as his third result for Verbier, which could drastically change his ranking. Going for the big double. Great use of that. Now he's got to control the speed as he cuts across that second feature. He has the, the ability to do so, just like George Rodney last year, putting his stuff together and adding another big drop where we've seen Logan do the 360, but definitely with more control, more speed on that top section. Beautiful little turn out there. Now just kind of letting the style do the talking as he comes out onto the apron. And he's used that point scoring magnet that we talk about, the double into that second cliff band and then across, same feature that we saw Logan Peota on. So now can he hold it together as he comes onto this bottom section? None of the riders getting penalized here for traversing hard across this apron. Important to say that, no, no features here. Usually the judges would want to see someone attacking fall line. Fall line is the way that water would flow down a mountain, but because that's such a big wide open face and there's so much available in the bottom oh, section. And he's going for the big roller. Will we see a trick of him? Yes, we do. Huge! Oh no, Christopher Turdell has thrown away a fantastic run with, you've got to give it to him, the most courageous air that we've seen so far. He's waving, he's okay. Ah, uh, that's the most important thing. He's lost a but pole somewhere. <laughs> the air was the, like, he stopped rotating, I think because of the speed and how far he went down that to get his skis around. Huge. Yeah, uh, that's, that's my first take, have we ever seen again. Laid back, look, look. What? The moment Did he spotted the landing, yeah, he knew he he'd over-rotated. He wasn't even over-rotating. You don't think? No. He thought he has it. And when he wanted to bring his skis back, he was so fast that the resistance of the air didn't let his skis come underneath <laughs> his body. That's my guess. Well, there's a whopping... 
a big gap. There you go. He's got his pole. There is a huge gap between each of those landing points. It tells you just how steep that was. Wow. What an action. I want to see his GoPro footage of that. <laughs> I hope he's okay. That's that double. <laughs> Look, he did that beautifully. Textbook technical riding in huge consequence areas. See that? How comfortable he is. Killing speed. Unbelievable. He just drained it all off there, was able to hold on to it beautifully. And then and this here we have the biggest feature of the day yet. You're right. Yeah, the air, it looked like the air grabbed his tips, didn't it? Yeah. Most like he got stuck in a swan dive. <laughs> <laughs> we can laugh about it now because he's okay, but uh, he's got it. And <laughs> so good to see riders coming up from the qualifiers like Christopher made the cut last year coming on tour this year with a win in the first event and now he continues to rip he's not holding back he's not playing it safe he combines the m yeah this magic combination of being able to ride big big mountain lines and doing a big show on rollers and and tricks well we talked about it at the beginning of his run he was using a first and a sixth place for his current ranking, which put him in second. He's now going to be using a 22nd position. So a nervous wait for Christopher Turdell to see if he makes the top 12. Next rider in, it is Five, the Russian, four, Ivan Malakoff. Three, two, one, drop in. Ivan has quite some history on the tour. We have seen him on tour last year, coming from the qualifiers. He had a few crashes, so he didn't qualify. But with the motivation that uh, Malakovs has in him, he requalified straight on in the same year during the qualifiers and just was straight back on, on the tour. This year, he turned out differently. He went one of the most gnarly lines in Andorra and scored third place, and he's going big again. Huge drop, just like Jeremy Heights, straight lining he's and held putting it, it all together. That's what Jeremy wanted to do. And Ivan Malakoff has succeeded. We, there's a discussion to be had about Ivan. He has a phenomenal amount of skill that could be construed sometimes with his line choices as reckless. But when you see him land a line like that, it doesn't matter how reckless he is, he's got the skill to back it up. Yes, he does. It's unbelievable that um, he banks it also, he, or he backs it up with, with experience. This guy is not the youngest anymore but although he's been on tour for the first year last year uh, but uh, he has the passion in him and the skills with the balls <laughs> going for Amazing a big job. air at the bottom we haven't seen such a big feature at that in that area of the mountain yet it's not over yet he's got to make it through the Ooh. debris and he's gone that's what we said just before with uh, floor early that that flat section Variable Contours conditions are hard to tell. He's okay though. If anything, we've got a tiny bit of really high milky cloud starting to fill in now, and that is taking the sting out of the shadow. It's not like driving into a tunnel anymore. The shadow's weakened a bit, and the glare off the sunny snow has gone. So here huge. we have the top section. <laughs> this is so big and so fast. He did well to sit back well there and keep himself the, compact. He has the right skis to do so. And here we go, another stomp landing. And here he thought he has it, boom, into the powder. He could have shut down speed here maybe a little more, and then he got into the super flat part. This is kind of a half pipe transition, as you want to say. A compression almost. A compression, that's what I was looking doing, for. Thanks. You're kind of compressing down. Yeah. You really need to kill that off. I think lesson learned there by so many riders and especially on that section where you're not in a critical part of the face in the 60 meters leading up to that he had plenty of time as you said to kill a bit of speed there he didn't need to charge in there so let's see 59.33 it is a case of what could have been for the russian ivan malakoff he was so so strong could up have to been that an amazing point. score you, you saw the indications of the the, ju uh, the judges that we get there was a lot of green but of course the control was into the orange section now one of the most consistent riders on tour this year leo slemet got a fifth in valnor arcalis a sixth in chamonix and a fifth in fieberbrunn and those results are really going to let him unleash on this face now also starting into the steep part of that 
skiers left side, just like Randy Barker and uh, Steve Heusel. Going super, super fast and controlled it well. Now killing the speed as he comes in. Going for the backflip, sticking it. His signature move by now. Very solid technique there. Two good high consequence drops at the top of the run. And he's coming across the apron now. And you look up against Loic Colin Patton, currently sat in second, who had that constant line of features just delivering delivering we're looking at that long break now that 20 second break where the riders are just linking the the critical sections of the face but that backflip in that technical section definitely bumped his score way up there so he's on a roll he's on the 360 kind of a revenge because last year he gave it away with the trick at the bottom section coming into another one huge air this is going far there Too was no far. way you could hold on to that. No, Too you knew far. it. As the, as the milliseconds <laughs> ticked over, you were like, land, land, <laughs> land, please land. Oh, disappointment for Leo Slemmett, but he's got he's good results to sit back on. Wait wait a second, and the run is not finished. He, he came up that fast. Of course, it's not going to be a winning line anymore with a crash like that. Let's see what the judges will say. This but is one right. of the features that's really started. Last year, we only saw Sasha Ham and Flo Orley hit this. This year, it's becoming much more of a fixture. I think a lot of people have realized what you can bank off this. Yeah. Great full line descent from Leo Slemet. He would have had all the ingredients to uh, to win this event. Love that. Love Look, that top section. This is section. a very steep section right there. And then the backflip. This is not a perfect ramp where you kind of have a, a diving board. You really have to spin around. Here we have the 360 at the bottom section and then here the huge air. <laughs> <laughs> so one tumble. Yeah, but he was sitting down yeah. stuck. Well, so. I hope you at home are enjoying this as much as we are. There are some brilliant lines being laid down here. And it, it's roulette at the moment. We've seen some incredible skiers landing some incredible lines, and we've seen some amazing skiers dropping lines like that. But up to that point, Leo Slemet entertaining in the extreme. Current standings, Logan Peota, the 21-year-old Canadian, leads ahead of current tour standings, Leader Loic Colin Patton, who will have to wait to try and claim that world title in Verbier. Next in, though, it is the slope style destroyer Fabio Studat. Marty, you reckon that we might see a 720 out of him? Um, he has the two, abilities to do so. One, and uh, there I would are love some to see that. 720 great, on Alaskan terrain. The great thing is, he's not one of the first riders, so he has a few r r uh, kind of features that have been tracked, which uh, here. You usually, if you have a kind of a different angle on the takeoff, you can still have some fresh tracks to land, but you need those little tracks to actually get your spin around. Benny Mayer talked about that. Variable takeoffs are the hardest thing. So if you've got a, a line in there that you can use, then you've got a much better chance. And he's going straight into the action with that double. We've seen a lot of traffic. You see all the tricks, uh, tracks on there. Using it as a double. Ooh, you, you, you. Clinging to that second little drop yeah <laughs> not sure if it was planned but i guess so going for another double there excellent use of that fabio studer we applaud you that was a really creative use of that line and he did well to kill that speed off the first drop exactly he has the combination of big mountain skills and a lot of tricks in the back especially going big and stumping it clean into the backcountry he has been shooting for MSP this year in Les Arc, where they've found some really nice booters. So he is in shape to do something big, and I'm pretty sure he's going to that main roller that we've seen. And this I guess you're going to see a flat spin three going big. Beautiful. Well controlled. Not as big as the rest, but very wisely. Like, the, he couldn't have done it any smoother. Yeah, he, he measured the rotation to the amount of air he had perfectly. The landing just he was gliding into it. And Logan Pohoda, he's watching closely of his friend going down. They've been skiing together on the Skiers' Cup. That is a great mm, line. The bottom section, he would have needed to risk a little more in my eyes to get the top spot, but it will be enough for a podium, that's my guess. 
if anything, that 360, he made it look so easy. He did his best impression of a bald eagle kind of wheeling around, didn't he, on thermals. We have Julian Lopez at the moment and currently in third position, which we haven't seen much of action at the bottom, but of course the huge backflip of him. Here we have Fabio Stude again in the same section that we've seen Julian. Taking still it as a double. A, still found fresh landing there as well. And this yeah. is where he had to hold on, wasn't it? Yeah, but here I say it was planned. First I thought he got a little bit too much speed out of the first double. And here beautifully taking it from the top. Original approach to that double. The judges will score that well. And here we have his kind of signature trick by now. The cork three or flat spin three. He will probably correct me if I'm wrong. And then riding beautiful snow. That other side is sunbaked, just like what we see right here, but what he chose to ride was perfect dry snow. Yeah, rather than because they looked, as we saw that view then, the nose at the bottom there that he could have popped off would have taken him into the variable snow. That yeah. was your, yeah. if you're running through the, the line mentally in your head, you're like, do it, do it, take that. And then he pops back more to the left and into that deeper, fresher snow. Very understandable. They have some discussions because this is a crucial moment. Fabio did a great run, combined a lot of features, and we have currently Logan Pejota in the lead. Will he challenge his friend? My guess is podium, but not all the way up. Yeah, I'm with you there. I don't think it was quite as good. 85.3, it's good enough for third position. He pushes Julian Lopez into fourth, but can't reel in. Loic Colin Patton in second and Logan Payota in first. What does this mean for the overall rankings? Do we have a little time to discuss that? We have at the moment Loic still in the lead, but just by just about 150 points. So tight. Going into Verbier, this is what you want in a world championship battle. Logan Peota versus Loic Colin Patton. Drew Tabke now, he was the Freeride World Tour champion 2013. He's had a difficult year this year, 12th, 11th and 15th. Only just qualified for Haynes. He's in 14th position, so and he here we have here? no tracks. He's one of the last ski men rider going down. What does this mean? It is an original line. He's pulled no it No one has left. been riding this part before. And it is one of the steepest sections with the <gasps> most slough. You, 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 Lovely you. transfer. The eagle has landed, I would say. Did you see that? Beautiful style in the air. Difficult now, though, because he's, uh, he's not got an, an abundance of features pulling out for him. I just named that the most... Alaskan line or top section we've seen so far. Yeah, really steep, great technical control. Slough management to perfection. This is what we talked about, that point magnet on the double cliff. Oh, another little transfer there. Oh, he, he's loving that ridge. He was surfing it already. Look at that, and another, another one. one. Woo. Oh, he's enjoying that so much, this beautiful natural half pipe. Ser like serves for takeoffs wherever you want and again going into a zone no one else went it's going to be very difficult for the judges this such an impressive run but so so different to everything we've seen from uh, the other skiers it's Tom, Tom, Tom Burt will love this run such an original rider here we have going for another big drop and finishing it off Straight into the finish line. <laughs> don't, don't overcook it here. Yeah, no, he's smart. He has chosen a, a place to run out, which is not as a, com a compression as the other ones. That's, that what a beautiful one, run. Yeah, I think in terms of grace and technicality, that is the best run we've seen so far today. Some incredible control, really good kind of traverse takeoff, splitting the skis, digging his shoulders into the face, and then launching. Here we have that top section, as I said, one of the most Alaskan lines you can get in this mountain. Super steep. Look at that beautiful transition on the top and then finishing it off with a... Oh, going 
it's hard to know which speed you're allowed to take. And we didn't see the flip. 360. No. Uh, so sorry, the backflip. I didn't see that because I was looking on the mountain without. What you've got to take into account it. there as well is the that fact that. That was another big drop, sorry. Yeah. Bigger than I thought as well. Yeah. And what, what you've got to take into account was the rapidity with which those drops were coming. He knocked out four, five hits on that wind lip in the space of 15 seconds. Oh, it's going to be a hard one for the judges. Earn your money, gentlemen. <laughs> it's business time. How do you compare a run like that him. in I comparison to... <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Push it through for first. Yeah. Well, this is, this is the debate that you have. Personality and character of the faces. Drew Tabke has embraced Alaskan terrain. And he's taken Alaskan techniques to this. He hasn't tried to impress a freestyle approach. Yeah, although he did, he did uh, put some, some in there. Um, he he showed the full going into third place, pushing off the uh, Austrian Fabio Studer off the the podium. He will be gutted. Eighty-six point three three. Critical there is the fact that Logan, um, that Fabio Studer, is uh, in the freestyle element, and Drew Tabke has pushed him out a little bit. There were elements in both Loic and, oh, now Felix Vimas setting up. There were elements in Logan and Loic's runs of freestyle and free ride. But certainly Drew Tabke going all free ride with a proper Alaskan approach. Now we've got Felix Vimas, the German, and last skier to drop. Last skier to drop, and he will be not short of action, I can tell you that. Played it safe in uh, Andorra and Chamonix. Charged in Fieberbrunn. Picked up third place. There's nothing to lose for him, he said. Can only gain another big result. And Alaska is special for every one of those. And, it's, and, and he has also, again, this mixture of uh, being able to ride big mountain lines and doing big tricks at the same time. Here we go for the backflip. Landing it. it. <laughs> and Vimas has said categorically that he's ridden at 80-85% and he's not going to do that anymore. He wants to charge. And so. that's what he does here. Great top section. He's pumped. He's pushed up. And there are even more tricks in the bag. What's difficult there, though, is that you've seen so many other riders pulling in the double into a cliff and he's gotten two features there. And the first of those is not as strong as the double. That's the thing, how to compare exactly that top top part. It was not as big, but he was traveling far down. And with that backflip off such a spiny takeoff, not easy to do. So that disconnect, the apron, as we call it, the big face connecting the top and bottom sections of this venue. Uh, he will not get marked down for traversing across that. Here we go. Cranking in, he's going to spin this. Big flat spin and he stomps it. Yes! Now the challenge is to control that speed as he arrives. He was into calling the it. He was calling it. He did. He called that one to you earlier in the day. <laughs> and he's on that fluting spine section now. Really have another strong feature at the bottom. This will be a very strong result. Oh, yes. I think playing it safe there is How very far did difficult he travel? snow. That's, I want to see the replay. <laughs> it was big. Don't you worry about that. It's plenty big. We've got a collection of the French skiers making their way into the booth with us now. Julian Lopez and Loic Colin Patton. Two men with big smiles on their face after impressive runs. Loic, you're made to wait for your title, though. Here we go. Here's the top part of Felix. Different approach. Boom. Sticked it. And <laughs> this is fast. To shut down speed here is not easy to do. Another feature on top. You see everything green. So the fluid. And here we have this flat spin. Ooh, he had to go straight. <laughs> where was the grab, Felix? Where was the where was the grab? <laughs> Just opened up to slow the rotation down. And then he claims it. Oh yes. Definitely. So that was the last of the ski men. 14 very, very entertaining runs there. Where will Felix end up? That's a good question. Here now we, we have 
We've got Peota and Vima's runs there. We can do a comparison. You can see that big blue traverse from Felix Vima's there, just the disconnect. And then you can see the intensity of Logan Peota's run where he's got that short traverse and then he's hacking into that bottom section. Then we have Felix against, I would rather have him kind of against Fabio Studer. Very good mates, have been riding together. And For uh, me though, Drew Tabke and Rene Barkrud, I think those were the two. That was a different set of line, full line from start two for me was was the line. It has to go up against Tabke and uh, Barkred or Loic or Logan, where you've got that intensity, just bang, bang, bang. Okay, so uh, here are the boys in the come studio. In. Come on down. You've got Loic and uh, <laughs> Julian Lopez. Julian, a fantastic run for you. Jala! <laughs> The professional. <laughs> Loi, you happy with that run? Yeah, yeah, I'm really happy. I, uh, well, wait, I wait, wait, wait. Uh, we have the score. Uh, we have the score of Felix. What is second? Let's have a look. So Felix Vimas, solid run. Ooh, pushing up into fifth. And <laughs> <laughs> Julian Lopez, sixth place. <laughs> A lot of excitement <laughs> here in the booth. These two are going off because it means Julian Lopez will be skiing in oh, Verbier. Good to see you riding strong, man. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they'll be partying at Mammy Jane in Ace Le Band tonight. You're all welcome to party. Yes. Okay. Make your way down to Mammy Jane in Ace Le Band if you want to party tonight. Uh, confirmation of the men's skiing results then. Uh, the 21 year old Canadian, Logan Peota in first. Loic Colin Patton just behind him in second. Drew Tabke, fantastic run. Fabio Studer, Felix Vimas there. Julian Lopez in the top six. Uh, seventh position, Rene Barker. Then Housel Malakoff, Slemit, quite a long way down there. Unfortunate with his fall. With a big crash, yeah. Then Rizval Heights, Mayer, and Christopher Turdell, another rider who'd put together a beautiful <laughs> run and let it all go at the bottom. Okay, let's take a look at the overall standings. Loic Colin Patton is still in the top spot, but Logan Pejota has closed the gap behind him in second. Still very much to play for in Verbier there. Fabio Studer's good run puts him in third. Christopher Turdell's fall knocks him down to fourth. Slemitz's good results up to this point have held him in fifth. But when we look a bit further down the rankings, the cut for Verbier comes in 12th place. So Drew Tabke's podium finish means that he will get to ride in Verbier. Disappointment, though, for Julian Lopez and Benny Mayer. OK, well, that was the skiing, and it comes fast and furious here in Alaska. We've now got the snowboard women coming up. So let's take a look back at how the season has played out for them. Okay, the Swiss have proved their pedigree in the women's snowboarding with reigning champion Estelle Ballet trading blows with 2011 champ Anflor Marxer at the top of the standings. Coming into Haynes, they're tied for first place, so today promises to be a battle for the ages. But another good result here for the French rookie Marion Herty, currently sat in third, would open up the title race even further. So... How do you see this one playing out, Marty? Oh yeah, it's going to be a <laughs> it's going to be a little fight between <laughs> friends, I would say. Okay. Because uh, Marion and uh, Estelle and and Flora, they're really good friends. They're hanging out together on the tour all the time, making fool of each other, <laughs> well, and definitely uh, still very competitive. Well, honours are even at the top of the table there. They've got 4,700 points each, so no one can take the world title today. The big news, though, is that Michaela Holstein needs a top three place if she is going to unseat Elodie Mouton. The cut here for Verbier is the top four. So Elodie Mouton not in Alaska. It's a chance for Michaela Holstein to claim her place in Switzerland. Yeah, definitely Michaela already has her... Um, season goal passed with uh, being on tour for next season it's her rookie year 
Uh, definitely it will kind of uh, be the cream on the cake if she makes it to Verdier as well. Would uh, definitely would love to see her. She's riding normally in the Alberg region, Michaela, so she knows how to ride big terrain. Well, the defending world champion is going to kick things off today, Estelle Ballet. She was rookie in 2015, but you watch her now around the tour. For me, there's a real sense of confidence and almost a sense of entitlement to her. She doesn't feel like she's just joining the tour anymore or trying to establish herself. She holds herself like a champion for me. Oh, absolutely. Um, Estelle g has grown into this tour, into competitive free riding. And uh, she has, of course, gained a name of herself with the Free Ride World Tour title last season. She was already close the year before in her rookie year. But uh, now she is on a roll where sh she feels very comfortable in big mountains. She said earlier on that she finds Andorra, Chamonix and Fieberbrunn warm-up events the vertical there in the kind of 400 meter range you come here and it's almost doubled on this alaskan face so this is business time and she feels like you're really putting yourself to the test uh, she's got first place in andorra second in chamonix and a fourth in fieberbrunn so she's got plenty of Ten room seconds. to maneuver but she knows that she's under a lot of pressure is she going to go conservative no, Five, um, that's four, what she claimed from the beginning three, of the season. Two, I'm not one, holding back. Okay. I'm not riding yeah. tactics. I want to ride lines where I will be happy about, where I can look back and say I'm proud of that. Okay, so loading onto this first knoll with a lot of speed. Yeah, she plays it smart with uh, riding in the shady part where there is more pow so she can shut down speed like easier better let's put it that way really working hard to keep the speed under control as she and she's riding really fluid of course a lot of sliding should be arced as well but she is heading fast to that bottom section first tracks nice launch off that bottom little buttress there I think that was actually a cliff last year, but we've probably got another two or three meters of snow than we had last year, and it's yeah. turned into a kind of rolled feature now. You're right. The overall snow amount is so much more than last year. They had a great snow season here in Alaska, uh, but to be fair, the snow is, I would say, even better to ride because it's not as deep as last year. So uh, that's why we also saw such great performances of the riders. Big slash there. Just uh, line herself up onto that little rock drop there. And you can see how much the snow's warmed up down here. It's peeling off in those layers, thick, warm layers, rather than spraying up as fluff and powder into the air. Very fluid line from top to bottom, I must say. She was very committed. That top section, very steep se uh, section on that. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, not a spine, but a, a shoulder. Yep. So wide enough to do proper turns, but you can get out of rhythm fast. You have to do the turns where they're supposed to be. So crossing diagonally from the top left-hand side down to the bottom right, and you can see working away down that shoulder, as you call it, and then there was that drop at the end across, and then worked that little fluting, steeper area at the bottom really nicely. Solid run from Estelle Ballet, and the pressure now is on and floor marks to match that. Yeah, she put down a good run, very solid run. Definitely there is some margin to top that because Anne Fleur has the skills to ride just as fast and Anne Fleur has been riding in these mountains before. She has been on some film shoots in all kinds of terrain on this planet. So definitely is one of the most experienced riders we have here in the field. 80 points for Estelle Ballet, first rider in the women's snowboard category. So very high benchmark being set. It's going to take something pretty impressive to beat that score. Someone stepping outside their comfort zone, certainly. So Michaela Holstein under pressure now. If she wants to make the cut for Verbier, she needs a top three place. And as I said before, I think she doesn't feel that much pressure or she doesn't put the pressure on herself because she has already got secured the spot for next season. It's her first big line in Alaska. 
that she rides right now, she definitely wants to enjoy that one. So following Estelle Ballet's line down off that wind lip off the side of that feature, and then just controlling speed here. Plenty away. Down you can this this is a fantastic indicator of just how steep this part of the face is. The women still attacking it, but the skiing men were coming through here straight lining. Yeah, so but the, actually not on this shoulder. Super hard to do ride yeah, straight line on, on that shoulder because there is no run out. You have to jump at the end. But definitely um, steep section right there. You can see the slough moving. Now looking for a slightly bigger drop than Estelle did. Uh, came Taking off the it side on the side. That. Choosing last second to take it more to the rider's right of that little buttress there. But staying on the left-hand side of the apron here. So the features are going to come in a bit quicker. Estelle chose to traverse hard uh, left, rider's left across the apron. But And talking to the riders, this section here is such a, yeah, such a nice place to ride that you actually get distracted and say, ah, oh, Actually, I have some more features to come. <laughs> yeah, this is the textbook pleasure moment. So a couple of little drops there in a yes. good steep section of the face. I think certainly making the bottom section work harder than Estelle did. Looks like so far we will see another feature to come. Working. Just popping off the side of that. You can see that side you, you saw that pop, very slow, wet snow coming down. Of course, the, the sun in this uh, late March that we are in is already pretty strong. So it'll start to warm up this face. Incredibly warm yesterday. We didn't actually put four runners down. So you can see the comparison there. A really good four-line descent from Michaela Holstein. But how it will score remains to be seen. These are the highlights drop at the top he will see the slough moving this of course irritates you on the way down not sure shall you let the slough pass or can I make it through it so line fluidity and air and style not scoring that highly but control was good prioritized here we have the store coming up for the finish Michele Holsten 66.33, well behind Estelle Ballet, probably because of uh, line and fluidity reasons. Definitely Estelle Ballet kind of pushed the limit on how fast you can ride in this technical segment, especially at the top. So Marion Hayati next to drop. French woman, third at the Junior Worlds. Took Very talented rider. European Cups as well. Slopestyle rider who's transitioned into free riding and she's got that freestyle element. She always looks like her body language is being confident, going straight to the point, no playing around. Boom. Already in air in this steep section there. Nice, solid turn. Rather, we saw from Marion and from Michaela, uh, from Estelle and Michaela, then bouncing on their heels. She actually put in a couple uh, of really strong turns. Another air there, but got bounced off. A little bit out of control. Got her stuff together again. Keeps the speed up. That's important. Not to fall back. Now, beautiful vision here of that apron where it gets a little flatter <laughs> not flat just flatter using using those little spines there on the skier's right side of that apron great line choice there she's got a couple of really nice little pops in there as well not big drops but just working any of the wind lips or rollers that she can she comes up and it's a long run in other faces this would be already the finish line here there's another steep segment coming up Landing on that spine there. Just chucking the tail into it to kill a bit of speed as she landed. Technically very well ridden. 
throwing some smoke in the air, loving it. Another drop, very all round, good line choice, well, yeah. Well executed. There, there is just one bubble that she had. We'll see what the judges say about that. I think the array of other features that she used, we saw in comparison, I think Michaela had three features uh, and then one really small little pop at the yeah. bottom. We had six, maybe seven little airs there from Marion and one decent sized air. So again, very similar descent to Michaela, very full line, but for me, more features. Oh, definitely. I would even uh, put her up uh, against uh, Estelle. Yeah. Estelle maybe rode faster, oh but yeah. she chose also more the shoulder. She uh, stayed in the more technical couloirs. Here we have everything green instead of or except of uh, control. And also the bottom part with some more features, more techni technicality. <laughs> You'll get there in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Here we have that technical section that we was just talking about. I really enjoyed this line actually. It's interesting when you watch them back, isn't it? And you get to see it again. She packed so much in there. I think even with the bobble, it's going to be higher than Michaela. I don't think she can beat Estelle though. Yeah, the, the bobble def def definitely made the difference. So here it comes, 74 points, six points shy of Estelle Ballet, but convincingly beating Michaela Holstein. So Mi Michaela Holstein, three riders gone and she is on the bubble. What is Anne Floor Marks are gonna do? Last woman to drop in the snowboard women's category. So experienced. Although she said that she really doesn't like riding tracked faces. For her, it's all about getting clear snow. So it'll be interesting to see where she takes this line now, whether yep. she's gonna go and look for something unridden or whether she's gonna uh, tuck into that same line, at, at least the same start. Oh, she's going all the way. Where is she going? Very similar to Drew Tapke. Yep in, as I said, the most Alaskan terrain <laughs> or typical Alaskan terrain that you can get in this place. Cranked a big slough off the top there, released some snow. As you said, she loves to ski or ride untracked powder and that's what she's up to. A lot can, of slough management required in this section there. And it's moving quickly, so she's got a lot of work to do just oh managing God, that. Snow. It's perfect conditions. Great cliff. Yes, very fluid. Coming into the apron, letting it flow. Really, really solid line from Anflor Markser at the top. Arcing out some big turns across the apron. It. Just cutting away across now to that big roller where we saw Felix Vimas, uh, Leo Slemet. A Flo lot of ski guys here. and snowboarders even hit that one. He, she comes into a little more tracked area, but it's worth it because there is a roller that offers still a lot of untouched landings. Here we go. And she's going big. That was really big. Biggest there we've seen from the women. And, and she's she puts it together. The speed. That is a winning line so far. She has to put it together all the way down, though. Well, it's been a literally a bare knuckle fist fight between Anne Floor Markser and Estelle Ballet this season, and that this run is a knockout blow right now. Well for controlled, Anne well deserved. Super technical with some big airs. That is an undisputed winning run for me from Anne Floor Markser. Absolutely, there's no doubt about it. It had everything, oh, no. the most uh, exposed area you can get into with everything uh, Alaskan. A specialist needs to have slough management, kind of control and, and getting the landmarks in. Very fluid at the top. And then this roller that we have seen. And she was not any short short of any of the, the guys' lines. Okay, so there's the comparison. Estelle Ballet is the red line. Anflor Marks are the blue line. And as you said at the top there, Marty, real Alaskan terrain there. And we saw Drew Tabke really marked up for taking that terrain on. And for me, Anflor Marks have really didn't hold back there. <laughs> no, not at all. Like, uh, all the experience that she has came into play. 
and that yeah the overview she had to to ride through that fluently impressive very impressive 88.33 i'm going to go out on a limb that's the most impressive free ride snowboard line i've seen on the free ride world tour in a very long time from the snowboard women oh yeah like uh, i'm with you definitely that was I very very impressive and floor marks at take a bow Let's take a look at those overall standings then. All four women have descended. Elodie Mouton is not competing. Uh, Michaela Holstein has been tucked down into fourth, so she won't make it to Verbier. But we have a fantastic battle shaping up. So Anne Floor marks at 88.3, takes first. Estelle Ballet in second. Marion Herty did enough to claim third there. And Michaela Holstein in fourth with 66.3. So these are the overall standings for women snowboarding. And Floor Marx's win pushes her just out in front of Estelle Ballet. But those two are going to battle it out again in Verbier for the overall title. Marianne Herity is in third. Elodie Mouton, who did not ride here in Alaska, maintains her qualification spot for Verbier because Michaela Holstein couldn't make the top three. We're now moving on to... The ski women's category, and this one promises to be another dramatic category. Eva Volkner doing exceedingly well, but plenty of talented competition behind her. So it's been a stellar season for Eva Volkner, the defending tour champion, opened with a second in Andorra and followed that up with a first in Chamonix. But the young Italian rookie Ariana Tricomi is growing in confidence. After two fourth place finishes, she won the last event in Fieberbrunn. American Jackie Passo is currently sat in third after her win in Andorra. She struggled to find the podium and she recapture her form here on home soil. Well. Start order today, we've got Lauren Cameron giving way to the Swede, Evelina, Evelina Nielsen, then Matilda Rappaport, then it's Jackie Passo, currently in third, then Eva Walkner, and then Ariana Tricom Tricomi will be the last to drop. Right now, though, we have our man, David Damasi, at the top of the peak with Evelina Nielsen. Hey guys, I am sitting here on this beautiful Alaskan summit with Evelina Nielsen and she comes from a mogul background so we're going to ask her a question from Ben from Sweden. Now what do you prefer, skiing moguls or skiing these Alaskan spines? Well, it's my first time skiing Alaskan spines but I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. Have you ever skied any kind of spine feature before? Mm, not really. Okay, well, this is going to be a big moment for you because everyone's shredding super hard, so I hope you enjoy it. Good, good luck. Thank you. Yeah, the force is strong. <laughs> the force is strong with yeah, you. Okay. The Namaste. force is strong. Thank you guys, back to you. Here we have a little indicator of what she usually does or are passionate about, but definitely she is one of the strongest riders I've seen in many years to come from this free ride world qualifiers, and uh, I'm going to expect a lot of this young lady here in Alaska on the, her premiere. She's got her own gang. They're called the Jedis of Love. <laughs> the Jedis of Love. It's three, her and three of her friends. So we've got Lauren <laughs> Cameron, then the Jedi of Love, Evelina Nielsen. Matilda Rappaport will drop in third. Jacqueline Passo in fourth. Eva Volkner fifth. Ariana Tricomi will be the last to drop because Sylvia Moser, after a femur bruise, uh, she managed to knock her tibia and... Um, no, tibula and femur together. So she's not riding, and is neither is Nadine Valner. So two riders in the top eight there not dropping. Uh, Lauren Cameron, the Canadian out of Whistler, Canada, will be the first ski woman to drop. She has been riding, yeah, first year on the tour, coming from the qualifiers, from the Americas side, and uh, very happy to see a girl or competitor coming from the mecca of free riding or one of the meccas, uh, Whistler Blackhump. We have uh, a lot of strong riders in the in the competition, oh, not in the competition, in the filming side of the, our free skiing world. And great to see more and more come, like uh, Logan Pahoda from the same region. Just came in 
So Lauren scored her place here with the third in FIBA Brun. She drops now onto the main ridge out of start one. And this is a very steep section, as we said before. Kind of this side of the mountain, a little more baked. You can see the snow rolling down a little slower there yep. until it's accelerating into that slough that we are so used to see in these Alaskan mountains. Just hesitating slightly here, wants to make sure she's in exactly the right position, but body language to me, she's a little bit nervous as she approaches oh, yeah. this feature. And it is a very critical moment here. This is very technical terrain she is in right now. Oh, and she just hung up her skis. She doesn't make it easy for herself. This is really one of the steepest sections that you can uh, get into. You can see just that surface snow starting to slide as she comes across onto a big 45 degree roll. And all of that terrain just invisible to her from above. It's, ro it's a convex roll there, so she can't see the terrain until she's on top of it. And this needs a lot of experience to handle that well. Slough management is a big part in these mountains. Oh. Unfortunately, she got Ooh. into that deeper snow section and then couldn't hold on to it. I felt that was almost inevitable. Her body language at the top of the face, there wasn't any confidence, there wasn't any attack. For me, she was that was defense all the way. And on faces like this, well, we got we a fair bit of slough there. Yeah. She's fighting hard. She's pulled the airbag. The ABS has inflated there, and that's going to hold her on top of this pack. But these images out there might look like an avalanche. I have to tell you, this is accumulating slough. There have been no slabs released. This is really the part of the game riding in these mountains. If for anyone who doesn't know, describe what slough is. Slough is the snow that a skier while riding is uh, kind of releasing and is rolling down. And of course, uh, with more and more turns you're, you're putting on a mountain, the more slough is accumulating. And of course, it can end up into a pretty big, big channel. And if it thundles or it funnels down into a, uh, a sand clock, then of course it gets more heavy. That's, uh, yeah, a bottleneck, we call a it. bottleneck. OK, we're going to take a quick break, we'll, but we'll be back in a moment. So Lauren Cameron just freeing herself from that slough slide, making her way down to the bottom. She's fine, but yeah, difficult, difficult run for her. On big, steep faces like this, you need to have a confident mentality. You need to attack it. If you're holding back, you're slowing yourself down. And as we saw there, she got caught up in the slough, the snow that she'd cut off the face. Yeah, but she, she crashed because of uh, coming uh, out with speed out of that very steep section and uh, then the slough caught up with her so she didn't actually have uh, uh, yeah a big error of slough management but uh, definitely unlucky to be in the in the range of slough uh, when she fell but those turns that she made above the slower turns rather than really sending any of those lines she'd slowed it down a bit and that meant that it was all accumulating around her rather than getting quite because it, as you said during the line it wasn't moving that quickly
but she wasn't getting ahead of it. Yeah, that's correct. And the, the sunny, sunny parts that we see here, all those spines that have kind of completely two different aspects. We have the general uh, aspect of the mountain is east to northeast. But when you look at those uh, kind of individual shoulders or spines, then you have something that looks even into the southeast. So it's uh, pretty baked and the other part is uh, looking further into the north side of uh, the exposition. And this is pretty, dr yeah, it's perfect dry. Uh, January powder. Yeah. So you can see there as well, the gradient is the key bit. Average pitch is 45 degrees. So certainly out of start to the terrain under there where we saw Amflor marks and not long ago is just, it's pure Alaskan terrain. The kind of terrain that really you're, contr you're doing what I would call controlled falling. Once you get into something in the 48 to 50 degree range, you're not going to stop. You're committing to the face and you're going down whether you like it or not. So you do it, you attack it and try and set up a fast line. If you start trying to cut across it, then you're just going to end up getting dragged down the face and bouncing. So a couple of the guides there just freeing Lauren Cameron. Actually, her skis, I think they, they brought her skis or some skis because I can imagine that hers must be buried underneath that slough. Yeah, she got carried quite a long way there. They're just holding while well, Lauren is refitted with a set of skis. We saw Jeremy Heights descend earlier in deep powder with one ski, <laughs> yeah. which I think in itself should have got decent marks. Oh yeah, he will. He will be in the in the highlight show for sure. So next rider to drop will be Evelina Nielsen, who we saw David talking to before. Background in mogul skiing, which for me is one of. A lot of people come from race training, a lot of people come from freestyle, but to come from moguls, I think is a really unique set of skills. It gives you quick reactions and it gives you that aerial training as well. So you've got good technical skiing marked with good freestyle ability and air awareness. Oh, definitely. It's a very good base to, to start your career. But uh, of course, there is a lot more for skiing than uh, just to hit some moguls. Although I must say, it is an amazing base where you can start off and uh, I'm very sure that uh, a lot of those riders and especially North Americans um, they have uh, such a great scene of moguls from the very beginning of our sport and uh, what we actually in Europe lack a bit we're kind of more coming from that racing approach um, and uh, the Americans more from the from the mogul side. What's interesting now though is that we're starting to see people like Logan Pejota who free riding is coming of age and rather than coming to free riding from slope style or from alpine or from moguls people are actually growing up free riding now yeah that's true um the the resorts in my eyes also changed of being more open to that um back in the days it was yeah more out there now it's uh, within the 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 resorts you have that great free ride terrain uh, that is used by kids and uh, the experienced guys and uh, so you have kids that come along and they have already a ton of experience that we probably didn't even have with 30 years old exactly okay we're going to go back up to the top now though david damassi is with our current tour leader eva volkner i'm here with eva walkner and she has been crushing it this year we're sitting at the top just chowing down on some snow eva we have a question from Stu from chicago and that is what is your favorite line you've ever skied in a competition? Actually, it was just right uh, next to the corner. It was oh, yeah. dirty needles. It was, it's fucking steep, really, and I was shitting in my pants. And yeah, it's a run I will remember for the rest of my life. In the end, yeah, it was, it was pretty nice, but I was shitting my pants. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dirty needle will do that. And hello Good. to my friends at home, uh, family, Birgit, Pascal. Cross fingers for me, please. Thanks. <laughs> okay, good luck for your run. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You're more than welcome. Uh, okay, back to you guys. Thank you, David. Undoubtedly an answer from the heart there. Yeah, that was, you didn't hold back. I hope she's riding like that. Was that the answer you were looking for, Steve? Please, tweet us back. We'd love to know. Um, undoubtedly, the best lines are the ones that scare you the most. And as spectators, I think a lot of the lines we've witnessed today have done that. Uh, yeah, um... Although this face has not the consequences that we have, for example, in Verbier or just uh, across the face, so we have this dirty needle that we uh, got just 
uh, to know of Eva, um, these are with more consequences, so it's more fear in them. Here, definitely there is a fear of the dimension. Like if you hit that Buddha sailing down 25 to 30 meters distance, definitely it's not an easy thing. But uh, the consequences are not as high up there as uh, they would be in Verdi, for example. One of the hardest things to do when you're here in Alaska, what not a lot of people realize is the background behind these glorious days is the fact that you have a lot of sitting around. But this year, there were a couple of opportunities uh, in the waiting period before we ran the event uh, to get up on the mountain. And we saw that with a lot of people going cat skiing. Yeah, true. We have uh, the possibility here, just uh, new this year, with a cat run of uh, Siva Heli Skiing, which is our partner here in this uh, amazing operation to help the first free road world tour or the second this, this year and you see we didn't we're we haven't been blessed with beautiful sunny skies yet this is the be uh, best day we had so far we have the competition today it was pretty cloudy but that was that's what alaska is also about but this great feature that came along with the cat allowed the the guys and boys and girls to get out there and ski well a much bigger snowpack this year as well means that we've had uh, a lot more snow lower down so you can ride the trees where you get a bit of definition. It doesn't matter how cloudy it is, the trees give a bit of definition to the snow. So the cat can take you up and you can get a couple of runs inside the snow line. So one of the things that makes Alaska so special though is the snowpack. Well worth talking about. You can see here Alaska gets such huge volumes of snow and it's the mecca of free riding for two reasons. It's got jagged coastal mountain ranges and these peaks are covered in the best quality snow Mother Nature has to offer. Huge Aleutian storms ravage these mountains, unloading vast amounts of snow and because of their proximity to the ocean there is a lot of moisture in the air which means this snow is wet and sticky. These factors combine perfectly to allow snow to stick to gradients in the region of 55 to 60 degrees. It's a phenomenon unheard of anywhere else in the world. And it also helps create a more stable snowpack. Which means, in layman's terms, you can come here and ride perfect powder down the steepest faces with less danger of avalanche. It's an inviting prospect, Marty. Something that people will spend thousands of dollars mm. to uh, experience. You're right, you have a, a pilgrimage of free ride fanatics coming here every year. And of course, uh, all mm. the big film companies come here year after year to produce the best footage that they can do all year round. Mm. Well, it's a once in a lifetime experience for most skiers or snowboarders, but definitely one worth enjoying. We're gonna take a short commercial break and then we'll be back with Evelina Nielsen and the women's skiers. I love a good road trip. So there you can see start number one. Oh no, that's start number two. I do apologize. Just to the left of that area, you can see two tracks moving out of the picture on the left-hand side there. Drew Tabke and Anne Floor Markser. And that is the group of terrain right up sort of center, just center left, the center right of your picture. And that is a really, really steep little zone in there. Yeah, I would, I would even put it out there to be the steepest terrain you can get into within the venue. And uh, we'll see if we see some more girls getting in there. So the Jedi of Love, Star Wars fanatic, the Swede, Evelina Nielsen, 24 years old, out of order. Five, Race trained four, till 12. Three, but her two, dad was a heavy free ride influence. Whenever she wasn't racing, she was out shredding with her dad. 
And you can see that, that she was in big terrain from the beginning on. She is a very solid skier. Great to watch her. Here we have coming to the first feature. Using the same line as a lot of the snowboard women there, but cutting back now, coming onto this really lovely nose. Technical terrain there, you can see a lot of speed still. She keeps up the fluidity. That's what yeah, the judges want to see. Yeah, there's no hesitation. The body language in comparison to Lauren Cameron at the moment is completely different for me. Still really keeping the momentum going. And there is a bottom feature that she's aiming for, I'm pretty sure, to get out of that difficult zone. Keeping up the speed there. Beautiful drop, perfect landing. So far, a great run. Just opening it out. You can almost see the relief in her turns now. She makes yeah. it out. She's got that heavy, steep, technical top section out of the way, and she can start to relax a little bit. But she's coming up on what Tomba has described as the bowling ball effect. The bottom part of this face, we can't see it from this angle, but it's rolling out of sight. So what Evelina's approaching now is blind to her. Exactly. And it's a, such a long face that by now you already think, ah, oh, my legs are burning, <laughs> but it's still a very technical section to go. She's lost a little bit of fluidity and flow there, just side slipping through that section. Still kind of with a reason that stop would have probably not been needed. More damage to score, and she's going down. Oh. Getting stuck there. Do you think that was the <sighs> snow pack that, that hauled her in? Snow pack. It's a super long run. Legs are getting very, very tired. Like a... And actually, yeah, the, the snow is getting heavier down there. So, so disappointing. Variable. She put together a really solid run up, yeah. up to that point. And then she's just let it go. You can see right at the end of this run on the last 60 meters of vertical, out of a 740 meter vertical face. She'll be very, very disappointed with that. But it is her first year on the tour and she qualified herself for next season, which is very good to see. Another strong rider kind of pushing forward to the 2017 season. Here we have her run from the top where everything worked out well. The exit couldn't have done it any better. She, well, the two things that she said she was going to focus on when I spoke to her were slough management and route finding. And both of those fact, factors were really, really strong for me. So it's something that she's got to work on ahead of Verbier. Uh, Here that. we have the score of Evelina. It's going to be a 50 points straight. So... Next rider up in the start gate is Mathilde Rappaport, the she's here for a few missions. <laughs> Free Ride Walter is just one of them. She's actually here for also getting in some film lines. She has been here for the last, I think, three years, maybe it's a fourth time, something like that. So she's pretty experienced to ski this dimension of mountains which can be very intimidating if you come here for the first time yeah. but that's not the case for matilda she knows the zone she knows how alaskan snow behaves on steep faces you can see there just how steep it is where it drops away next to the start so there's no warm-up unless you're cutting around the back of the cornice you're straight into it so just Short hold for Matilda. Here we have the GoPro Hero cast, life image from the ridge. Injured in 2015. She's made a presence felt this year. Third in Chamonix, fifth in Fieberbrunn. So a solid result here combined with those. She'll drop the ninth place from Andorra and could move up into serious contention spot. Yeah, and she has the... Five. The ability to do so, she Three, can two, ride one, really dropping. technical terrain, strong, must be a Swedish thing. <laughs> strong riding in very technical areas. 
And as we've seen, very motivated, out of the gate, racing down the mountain. Lovely style, much more open turns than we've seen from Evelina and Lauren. I'm pretty sure her boyfriend is watching a great racer on the Alpine Racing Circus, Matthias Hargin. Hopefully to see him in Verbier racing again with us. And great style, great execution from Matilda. A little bit of hesitation there, but of course it was a big drop. Tucks up nicely, and gets her hands down over her knees yeah. for that drop. Here it's some time, some seconds to relax for Matilda. Those pleasure turns, I would call them. Still cranking them though, like actually attacking. She, she attacked the top face and now she's into this bottom section, just pulling a little bit further right. I know she's come back onto the nose here. So staying on that shaded side of the face where the snow is best quality. Racing through that section. Yeah. Great overview. This is where Evelina struggled. Just gonna see, yeah, she's come through that really nicely round Evelina's little track there where she'd got hung up. Snow is getting a little more variable. You can see here. Lovely drop. Added that one. And a very, very nice run there from Matilda Rappaport of Sweden. Won the Ver uh, Verbier event in 2013. She's definitely got the pedigree. Oh, yeah, she will be happy with that run, definitely. You can see Jackie Passo up there warming up, yeah. making sure she's ready. It's one of the hardest things, actually. You don't think about it, but timing your run, there's obviously a lot of sitting around, and you don't want to be letting your legs get too cold. So trying to get up to the top of the face maybe with half an hour just to settle yourself, but then warming yourself and prepping properly before your run. Here we have the replay. That top section, very fluid in a technical, difficult terrain. And here you can see that rollery takeoff. So it was hard to actually see where to jump. This is uh, unlike any uh, some other places, just like Verbier, where it's all the way steep, where you can actually sometimes even see the landing before taking off. <laughs> here it's too much roller to do to do so. Score coming in with a 71-33 solid score. Not all the way up there. There is still some margin for the judges, but. Definitely a great run. Yeah, conservative run maybe, but as you said at the start, very, very confident and she looked like she was experienced on yeah. Alaskan terrain. Yeah. So we're going to take a short break now before we see Jackie Passo. Interestingly, do you know what Mons is when you turn it upside down? I know. Snow! Snow. But they Love didn't that. see that yet. No. <laughs> so taking a look around at the stunning mountains here in Haynes, Alaska. These peaks and the snow they receive, Mother Nature's finest, are what have made it the free ride mecca. If you want to be a big mountain snowboarder, 
Um, these mountains are where you come and prove yourself. Very similar to the North Shore in Hawaii if you're a surfer. That's a good, very good example. And uh, with a, a swell period like this season, uh, where they have it, the, the, their peak season is from November till February? Yeah, November till March, February. Yeah. yeah. And I heard they had an amazing season with swell and swell after the other. Well, what's interesting about that is Hawaii is essentially a big volcano coming up from the seabed. So there's nothing, there's no continental shelf for the waves to hit. Here, we've got exactly the same thing, very steep sides. There's nothing to stop the snow sliding off it. So slough, instead of having fast swells, you have really fast moving slough here. So if you're riding steep mountains, you've got to know how to deal with slough. And really there's nowhere else in the world that you can train to do that. You have to come here and it takes three or four years to really get your head around slough management. Jackie Passo got a little bit of experience in Alaska. She was up here last year. Currently sat in third in the overall rankings. The American dropping in from start number and two. This is a revenge run. She had a crash last year, a bad one where she hurt her knee. And uh, she knows she can do better. She was really not happy with herself. Going for a big drop into a steep section. This is so technical to do. Great approach, great beginning for Jackie. She would have discussed this at length with her boyfriend, Rainer Barkred, who took a very similar line just over to the right-hand side. But so far, she's dealt with the gradient here very, very comfortably. Yeah, she's one of the girls that uh, has proven in the past that she can go big and uh, not only throwing herself down, but sticking it. And so uh, this first part was already a good start. Definitely, she knows the business well to know that she has to have a great end finish of that run as well to make a, a top top ranking, which she's aiming for. Of course, Alaska is her home stop being American. Put the afterburners on, out over that debris, and now she's on the clear part of the apron. Of course, Killing. enjoying those few turns right there before it gets back into the mix. Looks like heading to that huge roller that we've seen a lot of traffic on. So just working that little wind lip. Killing speed either side of it as she comes down towards that roller. But she's cut skiers left of the kicker. Which is still going to feed her into a fluting zone. But she's continuing to cut left. Just using what little shade there is there. Little right. cliff now. Yeah. It's a new zone. We haven't seen anyone riding there yet. But uh, I know that she she must have uh, had a different option there because she's choosing winning lines and uh, with not dropping anything or having have not having another feature in at the bottom, she knows that there's something missing. So there must have been something wrong kind of uh, orientation wise or maybe she got yeah, tweaking the knee. Anything can happen. You never know. Do you That's think a body language definitely, uh, as she came out, I saw her hands raised and then kind of <laughs> dropped quickly like she was frustrated. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. Yeah, that would explain that she uh, yeah, Fantastic. probably lost, lost orientation. Could, could be because it is such a vast terrain down there. So di really direct approach with the line, though. Here we have the top section with that drop very technical part right there this is a close-up shot so you don't see the ex uh, the exposure right there and here the bottom part which is where she's cruising down there must have been a different plan though as far as i know jackie she would have gone into a bigger section but maybe she didn't find it 66.33 second position for jackie passo and knowing the caliber of skier who's yet to drop, she won't be happy with that score. So this is the GoPro attached to the uh, start marshal. And he is looking at the current tour standings leader in women's ski, Eva Volkner. And she has the possibility to become world champion today. She has the golden bit. What are the the odds. Five, four, three, two, oh, do we one. have that somewhere? Oh, yeah, there's, there's still a fair bit of work she to do. She is off and going. And uh, she told me she is uh, 
Going fast, but maybe not risking everything. She's playing it smart. Told her, you have to be happy with your run. She said, okay, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> so she's starting really well. She knows the game. She has done it before. The reigning world champion, very similar aspect that we've seen her riding last year, which brought her the tour win here in Alaska. But she said she wants to step it up, and she's the first coming into that section. This is going to be crucial here to surf and to challenge her own slough. This time, going straight line. Big drop in her, to her own slough. Will she manage the speed? Yes, she does. Her racing background comes into play right here. Great speed management. That was definitely the crucial point of her whole run. And uh, whew, this could be, whew, this could be it. Yeah, a really, because really powerful run. It was a single move. The top part was good too, not as technical as the Evelina and uh, Matilda. Evelina had the crash. So she is uh, comparing herself with Matilda Rappaport at the moment great full line run and she took on the most technical part of that lower section really really steep difficult fluting area there with rocks and we have i remember <laughs> rightly that was exactly where this is a r almost a repeat of her line from last year it is and uh, this time she didn't kind of ski around it uh, that that feature but she hit that big cliff into that shoot dropping into her own slough here we have a cliff uh, drop just a little further above and here comes the crux. This is really difficult to do. Managing her slough, not waiting a second, dropping before her slough overtakes herself, bump. That's Stomped. commitment. Right that there. is that commitment. Really and then slowing commitment. down, this is the first spot for now. And there's only one more rider to come, so this is a very likely potential winning run here. Well. The next person to drop is the only person who can stop the almost destroyer. Well, she did, Eva Volkner bulldozes everyone. 83.33, 10 points, maybe even a little more daylight between her and Matilda Rappaport. So at the moment, Eva Volkner has two firsts and a second. Ariana Tricomi. He's the only person who can reel her in. She has a first from FIBA Brunt. Here we have the score in. Didn't see that 83.33. Wow, that is a big score, just what we expected. And as you, as you just said, the only girl, woman, that can push her off that podium spot here and off the championship seat is Ariana Tricomi from Italy. 10 seconds. So the girl from Alta Badia, living at the moment in the Five, free ride capital, four, Innsbruck three, of two, Europe. One. Free ride capital, Drop definitely, for snowboarders and skiers. Loves a bit of Alta Badia, though. She's always said if it's good snow, she will make her way home. She knows it too well. It's her rookie season. We have to consider that, although she's already skiing really strong and as if she would be already very uh, experienced on the tour. It's uh, getting a little more shady, of course. The sun is fading out of the, the venue. It's the last rider on this face that we see today, going Good for cliff. a big drop there. Great stomp. Great run so that. far. Doesn't have the same exposure as Volkner's run, but She's pulling in very similar run to Matilda Rappaport at this stage. Even more fluid, I would say, and uh, that's the, the recipe to get this win here in Alaska as well, as she just did it in Fieberbrunn two weeks ago. Finding just a bit of clear snow there to enjoy a couple of turns and now cutting lookers left, riders right back across to this bottom section now. But definitely she needs a strong finish to get... Uh, Eva Walkner off her top podium and the potential win of the Freeride World Tour title again here in Alaska. She's avoided a couple of key features there. She really needed to make the most of that. Oh, and she's holding on Ooh, just, just 
you see that variable snow right there with just a little different exposition as we were talking about it earlier. Yeah, exactly where we saw Evelina Nielsen struggling earlier on. She's going for another feature there. Will it be the game changer? Back slap, no, it didn't. It didn't do her score well. So <laughs> this is another win for Eva Walkner. She is on a roll. And I'm waiting for confirmation on this, but I think that means that Eva Volkner is world champion. If she wins here today, she will claim the world championship. Here we have the rep uh, repeat replay of the big drop of Ariana. Well executed. And here the bottom part. Of course, legs are getting also a little more tired. This is a, such a long run, close to 800 meters of vertical. She did so well to yeah. salvage that. Oh, yeah. So, so close to just clipping the tip of that trailing ski and going over the handlebars. But she managed well. Oh, no, and she has gone down on the traverse on the glacier, but that won't count. Once you're off the transition, then you are out in the clear, and she's right down at the bottom there. So you can see control, that back slap really damaging her score there. Hugo Harrison, Dion Newport, Tom Burr and Lolo Bess. Bertie Dernavo discussing those at length. So 69 points for Ariana Tricomi. Good enough for third place, sandwiched between Matilda Rappaport and Jackie Passo. But that does mean that Eva Volkner takes the win here in Haynes. It is her third, sorry, second win of the season. She took first in Chamonix, second in Andorra. So her three results going in. Eva Volkner is in first, Matilda Rappaport in second, Ariana Tricomi in third, Jackie Passo fourth, Evelina Nielsen in fifth, Lauren Cameron did not finish, and Sylvia Moser and L Nadine Volner did not start. And with those results, there is no change in the overall standings, except to say that Eva Volkner has repeated the feat she accomplished here last year in Alaska, Ariana Tricomi in second place. Matilda Rappaport, solid run from her, and that has put her into third place. Jackie Passo drops down to fourth. Nadine Volner, Evelina Nielsen will also get to ride in Verbier. Lauren Cameron missing out. And here we have a great example of... Uh, the terrain that the top three ski women used for this year's run. We have the winner in red, Eva Valkner. Very similar line to Loic Column Pattern, where you have a consistent, you've got features coming up all the time. There's yep. that big gap on both uh, Tricomi and Rappaport's lines. You've got that big gap in the middle where they come across the apron. That definitely is the advantage of that part of the face that she took, that there is actually no break. There is no apron kind of uh, s slowing down the momentum. For me, there is as well on both the blue and the green lines, so Matilda and uh, Ariana. They're pulling at the very bottom feature. They're pulling lookers right of what is a very critical phase. There are a lot of points could have been scored in this zone that we're looking at now. And they, they dodged that for me. That was, yep. if they'd got stuck into that, for me, that would have seen them crank up the points and maybe be able to reel Eva, Volk, Eva Volkner in. Uh, we're gonna head down to the finish area now though, where Mike Weyerhauser is with the winner of the men's ski category, Logan Pejota. Well, thank you, Ed. Thank you, McFly. I'm, I'm here with Logan Pejota, the man with the plan who laid it down here in Alaska. And I'm telling you, I just want to go, woo! God damn, I'm telling you. Anyways, Logan, tell me about today and tell me how everything came together for you. Oh, everything came together perfectly for me today. Skied my line exactly how I wanted to ski it. Couldn't have asked for anything better, really. Couldn't ask for anything better here in Alaska, wow. skiing like that, man, let me tell you. So, uh, so you're looking, you're looking down the road now. You're looking at Verbier and tell me how that's going to piece together for you. I'm just going to go give it my all again. Verbier, try and take the top again. That'd be the best thing for me. I mean, can you imagine wild card to, to this? How it's kind of, how it's all come together for you? This is astounding. Tell me, tell me about it. What goes through your head like this? Oh, I think I'm just going to make my hard worthy 
definitely show the guys that I have what it takes, and that's a good thing. Yeah, have you had, you've had a lot to prove. Do you think you've proven yourself this year to yourself and to them? Oh, I've definitely proven myself to myself for sure. I think everybody else is pretty happy on how I've been doing. And you got your family here to cheer you on as well. I know that's pretty cool. You drove up with the sleds all the way from BC and you've been having some fun, haven't you? Yeah, definitely gonna get out on the sled probably tomorrow or the next day, filming with my dad and his friend. Should be a good time. Okay, well, we might have to get through a little bit of champagne here today first, but back to you, Ed, and back to both of you. Thank you. Congratulations, Logan Pejoda, on his rookie season. He's on a roll. Unbelievable. That's kind of what we had a few times over the last few years, that you have those rookies that kind of come out into onto the scene. Of course, Logan is not a, a newbie anymore on the scene, but definitely newbie to, to such an environment like a tour. Well, the pressure of having to deliver on a run first time out. A start judge says go. You're not, it's not like you're filming. It's not like you're yeah. out there for yourself. You've got to deliver when the guy says to you, go. What's going to be fascinating for me, I think looking at Logan Peyota's style over the, over the course of the season, this face really suited him. I think for me, he definitely, as he said, he's proved himself, but Verbier is going to be the ultimate test. That is a classic big mountain, technical skiers mountain. And if he can conquer that and a face like this, then he's the consumer all-rounder. Yes, and every one of those champions in the f past few years had to do well in Verbier as well. Well, let's take a look at those rankings. There is a slither of daylight between uh, Colin Patton and Peota at the top of the standings, but right down Christopher Turdell, Fabio Studer, uh, all of these guys. I think Fabio Studer is just, no, he's not. He needs, uh, if it had been 5,675, then Fabio Studer could have made the top. But there's three men, Christopher Turdell, Logan Peota, and Loic Colin Patton, going to be battling it out for the top spot in Verbier. And three very different skiers for me. Oh, yeah. We have uh, com not completely different skiers, but they, they still have all of them a mix of uh, big mountain abilities or skills combining with freestyle elements. Um, but all of them have that from their past. Logan Pejote, for sure, like a, a lot of freestyle elements in, in his, his riding and in his past. Um, the youngest of the three, um, Christopher Tudel coming from the qualifiers, kind of a different background, all three of them. And uh, Louis Colombato in his third year, kind of the, not veteran, but the most experienced on the tour, uh, with his first win in the rookie year 2014. And uh, last year was uh, already a contender as well, coming into Verbier, and this year, being the leader of the pack. Well, it's been a big snow season in Verbier. The Bec de Ross, that famous face, is in fantastic condition. Let's give it a wave. Yeah, Here we are. The chopper. That's we our are. office. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic view of some of the most beautiful mountains on earth. And the venue here has delivered today. It's been absolutely spectacular. Yeah. Look at that. It's not often you get to deliver a link to a helicopter. <laughs> no. Taking a look into the judges' tent there as well. For me, I think today characterized by the fact that no one held back. Everyone prioritized sending it today. And we saw yeah. some very, very strong runs. Disappointment for riders like Leo Slemet. Uh, I think for me, and Christopher Turdell, certainly those two had got very, very strong runs that they'd laid down and were just cheated right at the finish of their runs out of a decent score. But we're going to see them in Verbier regardless. Oh, absolutely. And they're going to throw down again. Like this, of course, would have been the dream coming true for everyone to win on this uh, venue in, yeah, the Alaska is the pinnacle of our sport, the Mecca. It, it doesn't come any short. There is no cliche about that. And uh, so they definitely will be gutted, but they are not done yet. Christopher Todell and uh, also uh, Logan Pejoda and uh, Luik, they will be ready for the finals. And they'll be psyching themselves up to battle it out. Uh, I think now we've got a, uh, a short roundup of the day with uh, Bertie Dernava. Hello, Bertie, how are we doing today? Great, awesome day, beautiful powder riding, insane lines. 
insane lines. Uh, sometimes it seemed like it was quite hard to judge, put everything together, wasn't it? Yes, it's a long face, so sometimes riders have a great top and then not such a good bottom. Sometimes riders have a, an average run, but all the way through, so sometimes it is a bit difficult, but all in all, we, we were pretty in agreement with all the judges and we managed to score. Do you know, talking with, with Drew Tapke doing an interview earlier, um, he, he had a really good point. I said, how, why has it been a struggle for you this season? And he says, really, my skiing hasn't changed. Everyone else has just gotten better. And, and I can imagine over the years here in Alaska, you used to see people up the top that didn't always belong at the top of a line in Alaska. And now we're seeing some amazing riding. Can you tell me a little bit about that? It's true. And Drew is riding the same that he used to with his beautiful flow lines. And, uh, but now you see guys charging it so much harder on a few features. And we see maybe sometimes a few more crashes. But what it takes to make the podium is become really, really hard, especially on the men's ski category. And as far as the other categories go, can you give me a, just a brief synopsis of how that's, how that's uh, come together this year and say the ski women's category and both the snowboard categories? So in the snowboard men category, we started the show. We saw a little bit too many crashes in my eyes for the conditions we had. It was beautiful. Some charge a bit too hard, but we saw, we saw some winning runs, so it was a great show still. In the ski lady category, uh, we have a great winning run of Eva Walkner strong skiing and then we saw in the women category and floor who found some perfect spine perfect snow and her run looked like the most f fun run of the day and it was enough to win yeah amazing well good job all you guys over there in the judging booth you, they, they work hard they earn their money here at the free ride world tour i'll tell you that much thanks. thank you bertie back to you guys thanks mike thanks bertie fantastic i think bertie summed it up there and floor marks are one of the standouts of the day and Floor really stepped up the game in uh, women's snowboarding. That was so great to see because we all know that she can do it, but it has to be delivered as well. Yeah, and that's the thing, under pressure. But Bertie made an interesting point there as well, that this is fast becoming what the most prestigious event on tour. Alongside Verbia, you've got two events now that if you win here in Alaska, it says a lot about you as a skier or a snowboarder. Oh yeah, absolutely. We knew that kind of from the beginning, but uh, Alaska has uh, stood out to its expectations. Have you lived that? up, lived up to its expectations, uh, by far. Um, it's uh, such a hyped place, but uh, yeah, it doesn't come. Uh, nothing comes close to it. Well, there is one thing that does come close to it, and we're going to see that now. It's the final event of the Freeride World Tour season, the traditional closer. It's the Bec de Ross in Verbier. The pressure is on. Thousands of spectators every year. The adrenaline is just pumping. Once again, things getting really serious as far as world championship possibilities are concerned. Oh, 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 oh. I already have goosebumps what's up to grab in a one week to go. Is it one week or is it two? It's uh, two it's weeks. It's one week. April two the 2nd. Yeah, yeah, but it's two weeks from now. What's the date today? Well, like March close 22nd. to two weeks. Yeah, ten, anyway. ten days actually it is. <laughs> yeah. Because it's Tuesday, Monday today, and it'll start on the Saturday the 2nd of April. Correct. If there is such a thing as a coliseum in snow sports where gladiators do battle, it is the Bec de Ross in Verbier. Do not miss that. From Martin and I here in Haynes, Alaska, thank you for joining us. I hope, in the words of Marcus Aurelius, you have been <laughs> impressed. We'll see you in Verbier on April the 2nd. <laughs>